new laws and information. Driver's license and identification card fee increases. As of July 1, 2023, all credential fees, including driver's licenses, identification cards, commercial learner's permits and duplicates, increased by $6. A $0.75 cent surcharge, previously known as the Real ID surcharge, was added to all driver's license fees, for a total increase of $6.75 for driver's license fees. As of October 1, 2023, Filing fees for new credential applications increased to $16 and filing fees for renewal applications increased to $11. Please visit our website to view current fees. Driver's License for All Beginning October 1, 2023, DVS will implement Driver's License for All. This new law allows all Minnesotans to obtain a standard Minnesota identification card, permit or license regardless of their immigration status. The law eliminates the need to show proof of legal presence in the United States and updates the documents an individual will provide to obtain a card. Real ID Proof of Residency Changes The documents that an applicant can provide to prove their residence for Real ID have been updated as of August 1, 2023. The new proof documents include internet bills and cable bills to be used as utility bills, as well as allowing assisted living slash nursing home statements. The address on the proof of residency document must match the address on the application. Please visit our website for the updated list of proof documents. Caretaker information included on driver's license or identification card record. Minnesotans can now add information to their DVS record that will notify law enforcement that they are a caretaker for someone else. In the event of a crash, law enforcement officers will know that. There is someone at home who is dependent on the caretaker. This means that authorities can quickly respond to ensure the dependent individual is not left unattended. Not only does it offer reassurance that loved ones will be taken care of if the worst happens, but it also relieves anxiety and stress at the thought of leaving loved ones alone. Fee and tax exemptions for veterans with total service-connected disability this new law exempts veterans with a 100% total service connected disability from registration and wheelage taxes for up to two vehicles, title fees, and fees associated with driver's license and identification cards, including filing fees. Expansion of Eligibility for Veteran Designation on Credential This new law expands the types of veterans able to get the veteran indicator, as well as the proof documents permitted. The law allows a greater number of Minnesota veterans to have the veteran indicator displayed on their driver's license or identification card. Qualified applicants now include retired members of the National Guard or a reserve component of the U.S. Armed Forces. Proof documents include military retiree ID cards, veteran ID cards and veteran health ID cards, in addition to the DD-214 showing honorable or honorable conditions with 181 days of consecutive service. Elimination of Written Test Requirement for New Minnesota Residents Applicants for a Minnesota driver's license who are 21 and older and hold a valid, unexpired license from another state will no longer be required to take the written test. This new law also waives the written test requirement if the applicant holds a valid two-wheeled, motorcycle, endorsement from another state. Option to Provide Race and Ethnicity Data with Applications Beginning January 1, 2024, applications for new and renewed driver's licenses and identification cards will ask applicants to provide race and ethnicity data. Providing this data is voluntary and classified as private. Data will be shared with the Department of Public Safety Office of Traffic Safety, OTS, for purposes of studying traffic citations, driver's education, and more. Expansion of driver's license for medical reason. Creates the option for a 15-year-old to obtain a driver's license related to their own medical needs, the medical needs of a relative or for a disabled relative with difficulty driving. Applicant must meet requirements and provide required documentation. More information regarding exemptions to the minimum age requirement are found in Chapter 1. Expansion of Restricted License for Farm Work 
expands eligibility for the restricted farm license, underage drivers, to include applicants who are employed on a farm, regardless of whether their parent or guardian owns the farm. Other restrictions for the farm license remain the same. More information regarding exemptions to the minimum age requirement are found in Chapter 1. Remote Application Option for Incarcerated Individuals Authorizes remote renewal of driver's licenses and identification cards for applicants who are serving a sentence of longer than six months in a jail or correctional facility that does not have an existing agreement with DVS to provide this service. Reintegration License this new law creates the opportunity for qualifying applicants released from prison to obtain a valid driver's license without payment of outstanding fines or reinstatement fees. Applicants must meet eligibility requirements. The card expires 15 months after issuance and is cancelled if the applicant commits any violation that would result in a withdrawal of driving privileges. Driver's Manual and Study Materials this new law instructed DVS to create study materials for the written and road tests to assist individuals in preparing to take the required driving tests. Materials are available on the DVS website. Changes to Voter Registration for Driver's License and Identification Card Applications Rather than opting in to register to vote when applying for or renewing a driver's license or identification card, data on applicants who provide documentation of citizenship, U.S. passport, U.S. birth certificate, certificate of citizenship, etc., will be automatically transmitted to the Office of Secretary of State to register the individual to vote. If an individual has previously applied for a driver's license or identification card in Minnesota, DVS may no longer have a record of the documents they used to prove identity. The person may provide documentation demonstrating citizenship to begin the voter registration process under the new system. DVS will not send data to the Office of Secretary of State if the applicant provided these documents prior to October 1, 2023. If an individual does not wish to be registered to vote after providing DVS with citizenship documents, they must opt out with the Office of Secretary of State. More information about voting can be found at www.sos.mn.gov slash elections voting slash register to vote. Crime to Obstruct the Work of a DVS Employee It is a crime to obstruct the work of a DVS employee. Min, Stat 609.50, Subbed. 5. Completing the pre-application makes office visits quicker. The pre-application in DVS Online Services will allow you to enter a significant portion of your application online and reduce the time spent at the counter when completing the transaction. DVS Online Services, also available on mobile devices, includes the list of required documents for each license type so you can have all the necessary documents ready when you visit a driver's license office. Please be sure to bring your confirmation page and the documents listed on the confirmation letter. Start your application online using the pre-application feature, no more than 30 days before visiting the driver's license office, to eliminate the need to complete a paper application. A message from the Commissioner of Public Safety Dear fellow Minnesotan, whether you're an experienced driver who has been behind the wheel for decades or a teenager just getting to know the rules of the road for the first time, the Minnesota Department of Public Safety Driver and Vehicle Services, DVS, is committed to ensuring that everyone with a driver's license knows the laws and practices that lead to safe driving. There are more than 4.5 million licensed drivers in Minnesota, and that number will only grow as we implement the driver's license for all law passed by the Minnesota Legislature. Our goal is for all of those drivers, as well as the pedestrians and cyclists they share the road with, to navigate our state's roads safely and get home to their loved ones. This manual lays out how we can all do our part to achieve that goal, as well as the process for becoming a licensed driver in Minnesota. DVS has taken great strides to make sure our vitally important services are accessible to Minnesotans of all backgrounds. Visit drive.mn.gov to access our multilingual virtual assistant in English, Spanish, Somali, and Hmong, and to set up your MyDVS account to track your license and registration information online. Remember that driving is a privilege that comes with a responsibility to the others on the road.
please buckle up, obey the speed laws, and never drive under the influence of alcohol. Respect for traffic laws and respect for other drivers is what keeps us all safe on the road. Sincerely, Bob Jacobson, Commissioner of Public Safety. Table of Contents Written and Road Test Checklists 1 to 2. Chapter 1 Your License to Drive 11. Chapter 2 Your Vehicle 28. Chapter 3 Traffic Laws and Vehicle Operation 33. Chapter 4 Sharing the Road 51. Chapter 5 Signs, Signals, and Pavement Marking 67. Chapter 6 Driving Conditions 85. Chapter 7 Your Driving Privileges 103. Chapter 8 Impaired Driving 107. Chapter 9 Information Directory and Index 114. About this manual. This manual concerns Minnesota laws and requirements. For complete standards, consult Minnesota state statutes and rules. This document is not a proper legal authority to cite in court. State of Minnesota Department of Public Safety This Minnesota Driver's Manual is printed by permission of the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. This information can be made available in alternative formats to individuals with disabilities. For assistance, call 651-297-3298 or TTY 651-282-6555. Roundabout road illustrations provided by Local Road Research Board. Form number 30,000-33, November 2021. Written Test Checklist Do you have all the information you need for your written test? Here is a checklist to help you prepare for your visit. I have made a Class D written test appointment. I have completed the online pre-application at drive.mn.gov no more than 30 days before my appointment. I have the required identification, see pages 4 to 6. I know my social security number, SSN, if I am eligible for a SSN. I have money with me to pay the appropriate fees. If under 18 years of age, I am at least 15 years old. I have my certificate of enrollment, blue card, proving that. I completed classroom instruction and am signed up for behind the wheel instruction, or I have my certificate of enrollment, pink card, proving that I am enrolled in a concurrent driver education course and have completed the first 15 classroom hours of the curriculum. If completed, I have the supplemental parental curriculum completion certificate. My parent, court-appointed guardian, county-appointed foster parent or the director of the transitional living program I am residing in will sign and approve my application. If the application will be signed by a person other than my parent, I have the appropriate documentation. Road Test Checklist Do you have all the information you need for your road test? Here is a checklist to help you prepare for your visit. I have made a road test appointment. I have completed the online pre-application at drive.mn.gov no more than 30 days before my appointment. I have my valid instruction permit to give to the examiner. I will provide a vehicle that is in safe working condition in which to take the test. Doors must open from the inside and outside. Seat belts must work properly. Headlights, taillights, brake lights, and turn signals must be in working order. Vehicle registration, license plates and stickers, must be current or the vehicle must display a 21-day permit. I have current proof of insurance for the vehicle I will use for the test. Acceptable proof of insurance includes, original insurance card issued by company, policy declaration page, e-insurance printed from insurance company website or presented on an electronic device. I have money with me to pay the appropriate fees. If under 18 years of age, I am at least 16 years old. I have my certificate of course completion, white card, proving that I have completed driver education. I have held an instruction permit for the last six months without a conviction for a moving violation or an alcohol or controlled substance violation. If all or part of my six months of driving experience was in a state other than Minnesota, I have a certified driving record from that state to verify that I qualify for the provisional license. 
I have my supervised driving log completed and signed by a parent or guardian. If completed, I have the Supplemental Parental Curriculum Completion Certificate. My parent, court-appointed guardian, county-appointed foster parent or the director of the transitional living program I am residing in will sign and approve my application. If the application will be signed by a person other than my parent, I have the appropriate documentation. If 18 years of age, I have had my instruction permit for at least six months. If 19 years of age or older, I have had my instruction permit for at least three months. Chapter This chapter provides information about how to obtain a Minnesota driver's license. Getting your license to drive Anyone who drives a motor vehicle on public streets or highways in Minnesota must carry a valid and unexpired driver's license. If you have never had a driver's license in any state or country, you must pass a written test and a vision test, apply for an instruction permit and pass a road test. If your Minnesota driver's license has been expired for more than one year, but less than five years, you must pass a written test and a vision test before applying for a new license. If you are 21 or over and moving to Minnesota from another state, certain U.S. territories or Canada, you can obtain a license by passing the vision test. You have up to 60 days after becoming a resident to obtain your regular Minnesota license or permit, with a commercial license up to 30 days. You must also present a valid, unexpired driver's license, or one expired for less than one year, from your former home state. If your former home state license is expired more than one year, you may be required to pass a written test and road test. If you have a motorcycle endorsement on your valid, unexpired out-of-state license, you can obtain a Minnesota endorsement by paying the appropriate fees. If your license is expired and you wish to obtain a motorcycle endorsement, you may be required to pass a written test, a road test and pay appropriate fees. If you are moving to Minnesota from a country other than the United States or Canada, you must pass a written test, a vision test, and a road test even if you have a valid license from your former country. You will not be eligible to receive your Minnesota driver's license until you have presented all other driver's licenses and identification cards in your possession to the Department of Public Safety. Who does not need a Minnesota license? You may drive a motor vehicle on public roads in Minnesota without a valid Minnesota driver's license or permit, if you meet one of these exceptions. You are a non-resident who is at least 15 years of age and have in your possession a valid driver's license issued to you in your home state or country. You have become a resident of Minnesota and have a valid driver's license issued by another state, a Canadian province or U.S. military authority. You have up to 60 days after becoming a resident to obtain your regular Minnesota license. You have a valid commercial driver's license from another state. In this case, you have up to 30 days after becoming a Minnesota resident to obtain your commercial Minnesota license. You are employed by, or in service to, the U.S. government and you are driving or operating, for military purposes, a commercial motor vehicle for the U.S. government. You are not a Minnesota resident, are at least 18 years of age, your home country does not require drivers to be licensed, and the vehicle you drive is registered for the current year in your home country. You may legally drive this vehicle in Minnesota for not more than 90 days in any calendar year without a valid license or permit. You temporarily drive a farm tractor or other farm implement on a public roadway. You are operating a snowmobile. To learn about laws that apply to driving snowmobiles, visit the Department of Natural Resources website at www.dnr.state.mn.us. You are a railroad operator operating a railroad locomotive or train or on-track equipment upon the rails. This includes operation while crossing a street or highway, whether public or private. Who cannot be licensed? A Minnesota driver's license or instruction permit will not be issued to you if you fail to present proper identification. You fail to complete or pass any part of the required driver's license tests. You are unable to read and understand official road signs or understand state traffic laws. You are under 15 years of age. You are under 18 years of age 
do not have a valid license from another state, and cannot present a certificate proving that you have completed an approved driver education course. You are 18 years of age or younger and have possessed an instruction permit for less than six months. You are 19 years of age or older and have possessed an instruction permit for less than three months. Your license is suspended and you have not met all reinstatement requirements. Your license is revoked and you have not met all reinstatement requirements. Your license is cancelled. A court has ruled you to be mentally incompetent, and the Department of Public Safety has determined that you are incapable of driving a motor vehicle safely. The Commissioner of Public Safety has determined you to be incapable of driving a motor vehicle safely because of a physical or mental disability. The Commissioner of Public Safety has good cause to believe that permitting you to operate a motor vehicle would be detrimental to public safety. Bring identification. You must present proper identification that verifies your first, middle, and last name and your date of birth to take the written and road tests. If the name on your identification documents do not match, you must also present Proof of your legal name changes Acceptable proof consists of certified marriage certificates, certified divorce decrees, or other certified court orders. Divorce decrees or other court orders must specify the name change. You must also present proper identification when you apply for an instruction permit, driver's license, or state identification card. Documents not in English must be accompanied by a qualified English translation, see page 4. Documents are subject to verification and may not be accepted if laminated or otherwise altered. Photocopies of identification documents are not acceptable. Fraudulent documents may be confiscated. What you need to bring when applying for a license or ID. Standard driver's license or ID. To apply for a standard driver's license, identification card, or permit, you may present a Minnesota driver's license, identification card, or permit that is current or expired for five years or less if it has a photo, or one year or less if it does not have a photo. If you do not have one of the items listed above, you must present two documents, including one document that contains your full name and the month, day, and year of your birth. DDS refers to these documents as primary and secondary documents. These documents may include a birth certificate, passport, or a social security card. If the name on your driver's license, identification card, or permit has changed or the names on your other documents do not match, you must also present proof of your legal name changes. Complete list of document requirements for a standard driver's license or ID. Real ID. Applying for a Real ID compliant card requires additional documentation compared to the requirements for a standard Minnesota driver's license. You must provide the following in person when applying. One document proving identity, date of birth, and legal presence in the United States. Oh, if the name on your identity document is not the same as your current name, a name change document must be submitted. One document proving social security number. Two documents proving current residency in Minnesota. Complete list of acceptable documents for real ID. Enhanced driver's license or ID. Applying for an EDL or EID requires additional requirements and documentation compared to a standard Minnesota license. Only an applicant who can provide proof of identity, full legal name, social security number, photographic identity, Minnesota residency, and U.S. citizenship is eligible for a Minnesota EDL or EID. Two types of documents must be submitted to prove Minnesota residency. For example, an electric bill or phone bill and a tax return. An EDL slash EID must list your Minnesota residence address. You must complete an interview questionnaire at the time of application. A $15 fee is required in addition to the fee for a driver's license or ID card. Complete list of document requirements for an EDL or EID. Verification of name change. If you legally change your name through marriage, divorce, or a court order, you must show proof of the change. You must present a certified marriage certificate, a certified court order specifying the name change, or a certified divorce decree or dissolution of marriage certificate specifying the name change. 
If you have had a series of name changes, you must provide documentation of all of those changes. Translation of Documents All documents presented in a language other than English must be accompanied by an English translation. The Certificate of Translation form is available here, driver examination stations, and at driver's license offices. The translator must certify all the following. The document is accompanied by a full English translation. The translation of the document is true and accurate. Accurate means that all the words on the presented document have been correctly translated. The translator is not related by blood or marriage to the subject of the document. The translator is competent to translate from language of above named document into English. I understand that if any part of the translation is intentionally false, I will be subject to penalty. Social Security Number Applicants for Minnesota Driver and Vehicle Services cards are required to provide their Social Security Number, SSN, on the application form. Applicants who have not been issued a SSN must elect to not specify that information on the form. Your Social Security Number is private information that will be secure on the driver's license information system and accessible only to those lawfully authorized to access it. Social security numbers are not located on, or embedded in, driver's licenses or identification cards. Under 42 U.S.C. Section 405, C. 2, C. I, the state is expressly authorized to require the disclosure of social security numbers in the administration of driver's license programs. If you do not provide an SSN when you are eligible for one, Minnesota is unable to process your application for a driver's license or identification card. The written test. You can take the written test at driver examination stations located throughout the state. Appointments are required for the Class D written test. To schedule an appointment, go to drive.mn.gov. The written test contains multiple choice and true or false questions that evaluate your written and understanding of Minnesota traffic laws and road signs. The written test may be offered on paper or on a computer. At exam stations where the test is offered on a computer, you can take the test in English, one of several other languages, or in American Sign Language, ASL. Headphones are available to allow you to hear the questions as you read them. Please inquire at the exam station if you need special accommodations. You may take only one written test per day. You must obtain a score of 80% to pass. You must show proper identification before you will be permitted to take the test. If you are under 18 years of age, you must also present a certificate of enrollment, blue card or pink card, from an approved driver education course showing that you have completed the appropriate amount of classroom instruction and have enrolled in behind-the-wheel training. Classroom instruction is not required if you are 18 years of age or older. Information on homeschooling rules and regulations is available here. If you fail two consecutive written tests, you will be charged a fee of $10 to take a third test and any subsequent written test. The Vision Screening Your eyes will be screened when you apply for, or renew, your driver's license or instruction permit. This is not a medical examination. It is a screening to determine whether your vision meets minimum standards. Your normal or corrected vision must be at least 2040s, and your peripheral vision must be at least 105 degrees. If your peripheral vision is less than 105 degrees or you fail the vision screening, you will be asked to see an eye doctor and return the doctor's report to the Driver and Vehicle Services Driver Evaluation Unit. The purpose of the report is to determine whether you see well enough to drive safely or if vision correction or other restrictions are needed. The Road Test the road test consists of a demonstration of your vehicle's safety equipment, your vehicle control skills, and a driving performance test. You will be tested on the rules of the road and your ability to drive a motor vehicle safely under normal traffic conditions. The examiner will evaluate your awareness of risks and your reaction to them. You will be evaluated on your ability to use good observation at intersections when changing lanes and in other situations. You will not be asked to do anything illegal during the test. 
When you have the necessary driving skills and meet all the requirements, you are ready to take the road test. An appointment is required and can be scheduled online at drive.mn.gov or, in the 7-county metro area, call 651-284-1234. In order to take the road test, you must present your valid instruction permit and current proof of insurance in the form of the original insurance identification card or policy. If you are under 18 years of age, you must present a supervised driving log and a certificate of course completion, white card, that proves you have completed an approved driver education course and behind-the-wheel instruction. You must provide your own vehicle to take the test. Neighborhood electric vehicles, NEVs, may not be used for this test. If a rental vehicle is going to be used for the road test, the person taking the test must be listed as a driver on the rental agreement. The vehicle doors must open from both the inside and the outside. Seat belts must work properly. The headlights, taillights, turn signals, and brake lights must be in working order. Any equipment required by restrictions on your license or instruction permit must be in working order, unless you are attempting to have the restrictions removed. Vehicles equipped with backup cameras are allowed during the test, but should not be the only method of observation when backing up. Smoking is not allowed during the test, and the vehicle must be free of smoke before the examiner enters the vehicle. No electronic devices or cell phone usage is allowed during the test. No passengers, other than the driver examiner, may occupy the vehicle while you are taking the test. This includes pets, children, and interpreters. Loose objects that could break or cause injury must be removed from the vehicle prior to the road test. Vehicles equipped with parking assist for parallel parking cannot be used when performing parallel parking during the test. If you fail two consecutive road tests, you will be charged a fee of $20 to take a third test and any subsequent road test. Vehicle Safety Equipment Demonstration You may be asked to perform a safety equipment check of your vehicle before you begin the road test. It must be in safe working condition and have all necessary equipment. You will be asked to demonstrate knowledge about Seat Adjustment Seat Belts Emergency, Parking, Brake Activating headlights, high and low beams. Vehicles with fully automatic headlights require the driver to manually activate the high and low beam headlights. Activating hazard warning lights, four-way flashers. Horn. Windshield wipers. Windshield defroster and fan controls. Mirrors. Fuel gauge. This list does not include all equipment and items required by law. If you are unable to pass the safety equipment demonstration, you will not be allowed to finish the road test that day. Vehicle Control Skills and Driving Performance During the road test, you will be examined and evaluated on your Control of the vehicle Ability to parallel park Ability to park on a hill Response to traffic and road conditions, traffic signs, and signals Ability to signal and perform right and left turns properly. Ability to use both marked and unmarked lanes of traffic. Observation and consideration of pedestrians and other drivers. Ability to perform the 90-degree backing skill maneuver. This simulates backing into a 10-foot wide driveway or parking space. These actions will cause you to fail the road test immediately. Disobeying a traffic law. Dangerous, careless, or reckless driving, including any action that could result in a traffic crash. A 90-degree backing skill maneuver. This simulates backing into a 10-foot wide driveway or parking space. Inability to control your vehicle or complete a maneuver without assistance from the examiner. Involving your vehicle in a crash that you could have avoided, even if you are not legally at fault. Not cooperating with the examiner or refusing to do something the examiner asks. If you fail the road test, you may retake it after you have had time to practice. You will be assigned practice time that must be completed before your next road test is given. If you fail the road test two times, an additional retest fee of $20 will be added for each road test taken thereafter.
If you fail the road test four times, you must complete at least six hours of behind the wheel instruction with a licensed instructor before taking the road test again. When you pass the road test, you may apply for your Minnesota driver's license. If you are under 18 years of age, your parent, legal guardian, county-appointed foster parent or director of the transitional living program in which you reside must sign and approve your application. The validated record of your road test score and your application receipt will serve as your temporary driver's license until you receive your permanent driver's license in the mail. Medical Conditions An application for an instruction permit or driver's license includes questions about medical conditions. Providing false information on the application could result in the loss of driving privileges. If you have a medical condition, you may be asked to provide a statement from a physician that indicates whether or not the condition interferes with your ability to drive safely. If you have a permit or license, and you are diagnosed with epilepsy or a medical condition that could cause loss of consciousness, you must submit a statement from a physician within 30 days of the diagnosis. The statement must indicate whether or not the condition interferes with your ability to drive safely. Medical statements should be sent to the Driver and Vehicle Services, Driver Evaluation Unit, 445, Minnesota Street, Suite 170, St. Paul, Minnesota, 55101-5170. For more information, contact the Driver Evaluation Unit at 651-296-2025. Parents' Approval for Under Age 18 If you are under 18 years of age, one of your parents, a court-appointed guardian, a county-appointed foster parent or the director of the transitional living program in which you reside must approve your application for a driver's license or instruction permit. If your parents are divorced, your custodial parent or a step-parent married to your custodial parent may approve your application. If you have no living parents or guardian, or if you are married or legally emancipated, a close family member, employer, or a spouse who is at least 18 years of age may sign your application. Approval can be withdrawn by the individual who signs the application. Forms can be obtained at driver license renewal offices and examination stations, and on the Driver and Vehicle Services website. If you are a foreign exchange student, your host sponsors are not authorized to sign your application without also having been given guardianship of you as a minor. Documentation must be provided. You will need two application forms to send to your parents for notarized. Signatures One is for the instruction permit, and the other is for the provisional license. The GDL System Minnesota has a Graduated Driver's Licensing GDL, system, which is designed to ease inexperienced drivers into the driving environment. Under the GDL system, anyone 18 years of age or younger must hold an instruction permit for at least six months before taking a road test. When you have passed the road test, you may apply for your license. Your Instruction Permit The first step to becoming a licensed driver is to obtain an instruction permit. The permit is valid for two years of practice driving with a licensed supervising driver sitting in the front passenger seat. It is illegal to practice driving without a valid instruction permit. When you drive, you must have your instruction permit in immediate possession. To qualify and obtain an instruction permit you must Be at least 15 years of age Complete 30 hours of classroom instruction and be enrolled in behind-the-wheel instruction or be enrolled in a concurrent driver education course and have completed the first 15 classroom hours of the curriculum. If you are 18 years of age or older, the classroom and behind-the-wheel instruction is not required. Comply with identification requirements. Pass a vision screening and a written test. Complete a license application and pay the required instruction permit fee. Under 18. If you are under 18 years of age, the supervising driver must be 21 years of age or older, every occupant must wear a seat belt or use a child passenger restraint system, and you may not use, or talk on, a cell phone while driving, with or without a hands-free cell phone device. 18 and older If you are 18 years of age or older, the supervising driver must be at least 18 years of age and all passengers must wear a seat belt or use a child passenger restraint system. 
After the required six months of practice driving, three months, if you are 19 years of age or older, you may take the road test. For road test scheduling information, see Chapter 9 of this manual. Before you will be allowed to take the road test, you must present to the driver examiner your valid instruction permit and current proof of insurance on the vehicle. If your instruction permit is lost or expired, you may apply for a new permit. The new permit will be valid for two years from the date of application. Your provisional license. The provisional license is the second phase of the GDL system. This license is valid for two years from the application date and has restrictions that do not apply to a full driver's license. Every occupant must wear a seat belt or use a child passenger restraint system and you may not use, or talk on, a cell phone while driving. This includes using a hands-free cell phone device. To qualify for your provisional license you must be at least 16 years of age, have completed the classroom and behind-the-wheel phases of driver education, have held an instruction permit for six months with no convictions for moving or alcohol-slash-controlled substance violations, submit a supervised driving log, Parents-slash-guardians have two options regarding the supervised driving log. Complete a supplemental parent class provided by a driver education program approved in Minnesota, and then submit a supervised driving log showing their teen has completed at least 40 hours of supervised driving, 15 of which are nighttime hours, or If the parent-slash-guardian chooses to not complete the supplemental parent class, the driving log must show that their teen has completed at least 50 hours of supervised driving, 15 of which are nighttime hours. Have passed a road test. A parent, court-appointed guardian, county-appointed foster parent or director of the transitional living program in which you reside must sign and approve your license application. When you have completed these requirements, you may apply for your provisional license and pay the appropriate fee. Provisional drivers are subject to nighttime and passenger limitations. During the first six months of licensure, driving is prohibited from midnight until 5 a.m. unless the provisional driver is accompanied by a licensed driver at least 25 years of age. Driving between home and work. Driving between home and a school event for which the school does not provide transportation. Driving for employment purposes. Additionally, for the first six months of licensure, only one passenger under the age of 20 is permitted, unless accompanied by a parent or guardian. During the second six months of licensure, no more than three passengers under the age of 20 are permitted, unless accompanied by a parent or guardian. Note, passengers under 20 who are members of the provisional driver's immediate family are permitted during both time periods. Vanessa's Law an unlicensed teen driver with a crash-related moving violation or an alcohol-slash-controlled substance-related violation, a violation of one or more statutes, including DWI, implied consent, open bottle, or underage drinking and driving-slash-not-a-drop law, cannot be given a license, instruction permit or provisional license until age 18. At 18, the driver must pass the Class D written test. Fulfill reinstatement requirements, including payment of fees, which can be up to $680, depending on circumstances. Obtain an instruction permit and hold it for at least six months. Pass the road test and make application for a new license. A licensed teen driver with a provisional license whose driving privileges were revoked due to a crash-related moving violation or an alcohol-slash-controlled substance-related violation cannot regain a license until age 18. At that time, the person must complete the following steps to obtain a full driver's license. Fulfill all reinstatement requirements, including the payment of fees which can be up to $680, depending on circumstances. Complete the classroom portion of a formal driver education course. Pass the Class D written test if your license has been expired over one year. Obtain an instruction permit and hold it for three months. Complete the behind-the-wheel portion of a driver education course and make application for a new license. Getting your under-21 Class D driver's license. To qualify for your under-21 Class D driver's license, 
you must be at least 18 years of age or have held a provisional license for at least 12 consecutive months with no convictions for alcohol violations, controlled substance violations, or crash-related moving violations, and have had not more than one conviction for a moving violation that is not crash-related. If you are under 18 years of age, you must certify that you have driven for not less than 10 hours under the supervision of a licensed driver who is at least 21 years of age. You must complete an application for a driver's license and pay the license fee. If you upgrade from a provisional license and have no violations on your record, you will receive a $3.50 credit toward the fee. If you are under 21 years of age, you will receive a license that is marked under 21. This license will expire on your 21st birthday. From then on, it will expire every four years on your birthday. Exceptions to Minimum Age Requirement a 15-year-old may qualify for a restricted farm work driver's license, a special medical driver's license, or a motorized bicycle, moped, permit after completing a driver education course and passing a road test. A restricted farm work driver's license allows individuals who are employed on a farm, regardless of whether their parent or guardian owns the farm, to help the farmer, parent, or guardian with farm work. The license holder may drive alone to perform farm work during daylight hours, within 40 miles of the farmhouse. To obtain a farm work driver's license for parents or guardian's farm, the applicant's parent or legal guardian must fill out a form. The completed form must be presented to the driver examiner at the time of the road test, along with a property tax statement that classifies the property as agricultural. If the parent or guardian rents the farmland, a rental agreement and property tax statement are required. To obtain a farm work driver's license when a minor is working for a farmer that is not the parent slash guardian, a farmer, the farm owner must also fill out a form attesting that the applicant requires the license for purposes of farm work and that they are the farm owner and provide the property tax statement for the property classifying the property as agricultural. Applicants do not need to wait six months before taking the road test for this license, but must apply for an instruction permit. When ready for their road test, applicant must present a certificate of completion from an approved behind-the-wheel driver education course and supervised driving log. The farm work restriction can be removed after the driver holds the license for six months and reaches 16 years of age. The farm work restriction will remain in effect until the driver applies to have it removed. A special medical driver's license may be issued to a 15-year-old when there are no licensed drivers in the household, and the applicant must drive a motor vehicle for personal medical needs or those of a relative, or a disabled relative who has a disability who does not have license due to a disability. Land, a rental agreement and property tax statement are required. Applicant must meet requirements and provide the required license for medical reason exemption form submitted for approval before a road test is given. The Commissioner of Public Safety may set conditions and limits. To ensure public safety, applicants do not need to wait six months before taking the road test for this license, but must apply for an instruction permit. When ready for their road test, applicant must present a certificate of completion from an approved behind-the-wheel driver education course and supervised driving log. The restriction will appear on the license as Medlam. A 15-year-old can obtain a motorized bicycle permit after completing a motorized bicycle safety course and passing a written test, vision test, and road test. Driver's License Classifications your driver's license allows you to drive a motor vehicle on public streets and highways. You must carry your license with you at all times when you are driving a motor vehicle. You must have the appropriate class of license and endorsement for the type of vehicle you are driving. Information about your license class and any endorsements or restrictions will be listed on the back of your driver's license. There are four classes of driver's licenses and several endorsements available to Minnesota drivers. Below is a brief description of the different license classes and endorsements. Class D License This is the most common license for Minnesota drivers. If you have a Class D driver's license, you may operate. All single-unit vehicles, cars, pickups, 
and small trucks, except those with a gross vehicle weight of 26,001 pounds or more, vehicles designed to carry more than 15 passengers, including the driver, and vehicles that carry hazardous materials. Any farm truck transporting agricultural products, farm machinery, or farm supplies, including hazardous materials, within 150 miles of the farm. The farm truck must be operated by the farmer, his or her immediate family member, or an employee of the farmer. Authorized emergency vehicles, whether or not in excess of 26,000 pounds gross vehicle weight. Recreational vehicles, motor homes and camping trailers, operated for your personal use. Motorized bicycles. Motorcycles, with the appropriate license endorsement. Neighborhood electric vehicles, NEVs. Autocycles. You may also tow a trailer or other vehicle if it has a gross vehicle weight of 10,000 pounds or less, or it has a gross vehicle weight of more than 10,000 pounds, but the combined gross vehicle weight of the vehicle and trailer is 26,000 pounds or less. License endorsements. You must have an endorsement on your license in order to drive motorcycles, buses, school buses, double and triple trailers, tank vehicles, and if you carry hazardous materials. All endorsements require additional written tests. Bus, school bus, and motorcycle endorsements require specialized road tests. Commercial Driver's Licenses Class A, B and C licenses are called Commercial Driver's Licenses, CDL. A CDL allows you to drive all Class D vehicles, in addition to certain types of vehicles included in each driver's license class. Class C License With a hazardous materials endorsement, a Class C license holder may transport hazardous materials in a Class D vehicle. With a tanker endorsement, you may carry hazardous liquid or gaseous materials in a permanently mounted or portable tank. Class B License A Class B license, with necessary endorsements, allows the holder to operate all Class C and D vehicles and all other single-unit vehicles. The holder of a Class B license may tow only vehicles with a gross vehicle weight of 10,000 pounds or less when operating a Class B power unit. Class A License With appropriate endorsements, a Class A license is valid for any vehicle or trailer combination. CDL Information For more information about CDLs and CDL requirements, see the Minnesota Commercial Driver's Manual which includes the Minnesota School Bus Driver's Handbook. These are available on the Driver and Vehicle Services website at drive.mn.gov. Note, if you operate any class of vehicle as an employer or employee, you may be subject to commercial motor carrier requirements. These requirements may apply to single unit and combination vehicles of more than 10,000 pounds gross vehicle weight, such as construction vehicles, vehicles used to deliver packages and other items, and vehicles designed or used to transport more than eight passengers, including the driver. In order to legally operate these vehicles, you may need to possess a valid U.S. Department of Transportation Medical Examiner Certificate. You may also be subject to restrictions on the number of hours you drive and to vehicle maintenance and inspection requirements. For more information, contact the Minnesota State Patrol at 651 405-6196 or the Minnesota Department of Transportation Office of Freight and Commercial Vehicle Operations at 651-215-6330. CDL for persons under 21 years of age. Minnesota residents under 21 years of age can obtain a CDL. The license will carry specific restrictions. License Renewal and Replacement. A driver's license issued by the state of Minnesota expires on your birthday and must be renewed every four years after you reach 21 years of age. If your current license is lost, damaged, or destroyed, you must apply for a duplicate license. If you have lost your license, you must present proper identification when it is time to renew it. Applicants for license renewal must pass a vision test. Name or address change if you change your name or address before your license expires, you must apply for a duplicate, replacement, license within 30 days. If you need a replacement instruction permit, you must renew your permit. 
Active Military Service If you are in active military service with the U.S. Armed Forces and have a valid unexpired Minnesota driver's license upon entering military service, you are not required to renew your license until you are separated or discharged, regardless of your length of service. To ensure that your driving record will be maintained, you will need to submit military documents to DVS that shows your date of entry into the military. Documents can be submitted online or mailed to Driver and Vehicle Services, 445 Minnesota Street, Suite 180, St. Paul, Minnesota, 55101. If you have questions, call DVS at 651-297-3298. You must renew your license within one year of your separation or discharge from active military service by presenting your Minnesota driver's license and your DD-214 military discharge papers. If moving to Minnesota with an out-of-state license and still in the military, you need to provide an in-service letter from your commanding officer to waive the road test. This exception also applies to a spouse, domestic partner, or dependent under age 26 of those in active military service if they do not reside in Minnesota during the active military service period. Peace Corps and Federal Foreign Service Employees If you are serving outside Minnesota as a volunteer in the Peace Corps, or are an employee of a federal department or agency and are assigned to foreign service outside of the United States and had a valid unexpired Minnesota driver's license upon starting your service or assignment, you are not required to renew your license until your service has ended, regardless of your length of service. To ensure that your driving record is maintained, you will need to submit documents to DVS that shows your beginning date of service or assignment. Documents can be Submitted on line or maileto, driver and vehicle services, 445 minnesotast, suite 180, st. Paul, minnesota 55101. You must renew your license within one year of your end of service or assignment by presenting your Minnesota driver's license and your service papers. This exception also applies to a spouse, domestic partner, or dependent under age 26, if they do not reside in Minnesota during the volunteer service or assignment. Selective Service If you are between the ages of 18 and 26, and are a U.S. citizen or resident, you will be registered with the U.S. Selective Service when you apply for any Minnesota Driver and Vehicle Services card. If you are under 18 years of age, DVS will withhold selective service registration until your 18th birthday. Consent to registration at the time of application is in compliance with the Military Selective Service. Act, U.S. Code Title 50 Appendix, Section 453 State Identification Cards You can apply for a Minnesota identification card at an office that accepts driver's license applications. You must present proper documentation for the card you are applying for, standard, real, or enhanced. You are only allowed to hold one type of card. DVS will not issue an identification card to a person who already has a valid driver's license or instruction permit without a downgrade statement stating the person is giving up their driving privileges. Driver Services Fees For a complete list of driver's license, identification card, and other driver services fees always refer to the driver's license fees page on the DVS. Website Fees are determined by law and are subject to change. Expedited, fast-track, services You can expedite your driver's license or identification card for an additional fee of $20. Certain applications do not qualify for fast-track services. These include but are not limited to enhanced driver's licenses and identification cards, any first-time applications, and when a license is upgraded. Driver's license or identification cards will be processed within three, three, business days. Customers should receive the card via UPS, United Parcel Service, within 10 business days. Before driving any motor vehicle on public roads, make sure it is fully equipped and in good mechanical condition. Become familiar with your vehicle. Read the operator's manual and know how to use all the equipment. Routinely check the lights, windshield wipers, horn, and tires to be sure they are in working order. Make sure you understand the functions of the gauges and warning indicators. Upon entering the vehicle, 
check your seat and mirrors to see if they require adjustments. Make sure passengers are seated in positions that do not obstruct your view or prevent you from driving normally. Adjust and buckle your seat belt and make sure all of your passengers do so. Vehicle Requirements Brakes All cars and trucks must have at least two separate brake systems, such as the foot brake and the parking-slash-emergency brake. Bumpers All private passenger vehicles must have front and rear bumpers. Pickup trucks and vans must have front bumpers and either rear bumpers or reflectors. Horn Your motor vehicle must have a working horn. Bells, sirens, and whistles are not horns and may be used only by emergency vehicles. Use your horn when it is necessary to avoid a crash. Don't honk unnecessarily. Avoid honking for purposes such as announcing your arrival. Headlights and taillights All motor vehicles, with the exception of motorcycles, must have two white headlights that work on high and low beam, and red taillights that illuminate when the brake pedal is pressed. When set on high beam, headlights must make objects visible on the road ahead from at least 350 feet away. Replace damaged headlights. A cracked lens allows moisture and dust to accumulate inside the lamp, resulting in loss of illumination and increased glare for other motorists. Clean your headlights as often as you clean your windshield. Dirty head. Lights can reduce light output by as much as 75%. Have your headlights inspected at least once a year to make sure they are aimed properly. Some headlamps require an adapter or special settings. Refer to your operator's manual for more information. Some vehicles have reduced power headlights, called daytime running lamps, which turn on automatically when you drive during the daytime. These lights make your vehicle easier for others to see. Tail lights and parking lights do not turn on automatically. Your headlights must be turned on at sunset and used until sunrise. They must also be used during weather conditions that include rain, snow, hail, sleet, or fog and any time you cannot clearly see the road ahead for a distance of at least 500 feet. License Plate Light A white light bulb must illuminate the rear license plate to make it visible at night. Turn Signals All turn signal lights must be in working order. You must use turn signals if your vehicle width, or the width of a load you are carrying, prevents drivers behind you from seeing your hand and arm signals. Prohibited lights Blue lights, flashing lights, and strobe lamps serve special purposes. They are not for use by non-authorized vehicles. Only snowplows, other road maintenance equipment, and authorized emergency vehicles may be equipped with blue lights. Only authorized emergency vehicles, school buses, road maintenance equipment, tow. Trucks, service vehicles, and farm equipment may be equipped with flashing lights. Only school buses, snow removal equipment, and rural mail carrier vehicles may be equipped with strobe lamps. Mufflers All motor vehicles must be equipped with mufflers that keep the vehicle from making sudden or prolonged loud noises particularly sharp popping or crackling sounds. Check the muffler regularly for carbon monoxide leaks. Rearview mirrors All passenger vehicles must be equipped with rearview mirrors. Vehicles such as rental moving trucks, which are not designed to allow a view through a rear window, must be equipped with an additional side mirror. Pickup trucks, which are often used for hauling purposes, must also be equipped with an additional side mirror. The side mirror will provide the driver with a clear view when transported materials obstruct sight through the rearview mirror. Seat belts and airbags. Be sure that seat belts are clean and in good condition, so they are available to all vehicle occupants. In Minnesota, motor vehicles must be equipped with seat belts, and use of seat belts is mandatory. Airbags are intended to work with seat belts to prevent injuries. They are not designed to keep occupants from being ejected. Keep dashboards free of debris or clutter. When airbags suddenly inflate, objects on the dashboard can become dangerous projectiles. Read your operator's manual before driving a vehicle equipped with airbags. Tires Tires must be able to carry your vehicle's weight and grip the surface of the road properly. 
Inspect tires regularly for cuts, cracks, uneven wear, bald spots, bulges, and punctures. Carry a good spare tire and check its pressure often. Tires do not have as much traction on gravel or dirt roads as they do on concrete or asphalt roads. Tires have been known to lose up to 1 psi pounds per square inch every month. Check your tire pressure often and never drive with underinflated tires. The vehicle's recommended tire pressure is located on a sticker inside the driver's door of your vehicle or in the owner's manual. Check your tires before you've driven or at least three hours after you've driven your vehicle. Insert a pressure gauge into the valve stem on your tire. The gauge will show a measured sigh. Compare the measured sigh to the sigh found on the sticker inside the driver's door or in the owner's manual. Do not compare to the sigh on your tire sidewall. If the measured sigh is above the number, let air out until it matches. If below, add air until it reaches the proper number. Check your tires often for wear and damage problems. A tire is illegal if the tread is less than 1 16th of an inch deep. An easy way to check for wear is by using the penny test. Take a penny and hold Abraham Lincoln's body between your thumb and forefinger. Select a point on your tire where the tread appears the lowest and place Lincoln's head into one of the grooves. If any part of Lincoln's head is covered by the tread, you're driving with the legal and safe amount of tread. If your tread gets below that, your vehicle's ability to grip the road in adverse conditions is greatly reduced. Windshield and Windows Your view through windshields and windows must not be obstructed by cracks, discoloration, steam, frost, ice, or snow when you are driving. Objects may not be suspended between the driver and the windshield. Labels and stickers or other devices permitted by state law may be placed on your windshield. These include state and national park stickers, official safety inspection stickers, and EasyPass electronic toll collection devices. Global positioning and other navigation systems may be mounted or located near the bottommost portion of the windshield. Driver feedback and safety monitoring equipment may be mounted immediately behind, slightly above, or slightly below the rearview mirror. Windshields may not be made of, covered by, or treated with any material that makes the glass more reflective or reduces the amount of light that travels through it. Any window tint material applied to the side or rear windows after August 1, 1985, must be marked to show the percentage of light that is transmitted and the percentage of reflection it creates. If it transmits less than 50% or reflects more than 20% of available light, it may be used only on the rear window of a pickup truck, or on the rear and side windows of a van, behind the driver's seat, limousine, or vehicle used by a funeral home. Windshield Wipers and Window Defrosters A motor vehicle with a glass windshield must be equipped with wipers in good working condition. Window defrosters are necessary to keep the windows and the windshield clear of steam and frost. Wheel guards or fenders. Passenger vehicles must be equipped with fenders or other wheel guards to prevent water, dirt, and other material from being picked up and thrown into the air by the tires. Fuel efficient techniques. Keep your car in good operating condition. Keep your engine properly tuned. Keep tires properly inflated. Use the recommended grade of motor oil. Drive efficiently. Plan and combine errands into one trip. Drive sensibly, avoid aggressive driving, such as speeding, rapid acceleration, and braking. Observe the speed limit. Remove excess weight, avoid keeping unnecessary heavy items in your vehicle. Use cruise control on the highway. Use overdrive gears. Take public transportation, use carpools, ride share, bike or walk whenever possible. Chapter Minnesota Traffic Laws Apply to everyone who operates a vehicle on public roads in this state. The following laws deal with controlling and operating your vehicle. On all roadways that are wide enough, a vehicle shall be driven on the right half of the roadway, except when overtaking or passing another vehicle traveling in the same direction under the passing rules. When the right half of the roadway is closed to traffic while under construction or repair. 
when the roadway is divided into three marked lanes. When the roadway is designated with signs as a one-way roadway. When necessary to comply with moving over when approaching an authorized vehicle parked or stopped on the roadway, move over law. Speed limits. The faster you drive, the less time you allow yourself to react to events on the road and around you. Traveling at faster speeds increases the likelihood of crashes. And when crashes occur at excessive speeds, victims' injuries tend to be more serious and death is more likely to result. Minnesota's basic speed law requires you to drive at a speed no faster than is reasonable under existing conditions. These include weather, traffic, and road conditions. Driving faster than the posted speed limit is illegal. The posted speed limit is the maximum speed permitted on that particular road. However, the speed limit on two-lane highways with a posted speed limit of 55 miles per hour or higher is increased by 10 miles per hour when the driver is lawfully passing another vehicle in the same direction. Minimum speed limits may be posted on some roads. It is illegal to drive slower than the posted minimum speed under normal weather, traffic, and road conditions. Note, if you approach an intersection at an unlawful speed, you lose the Right-of-way privilege associated with driving at a lawful speed. The following Minnesota speed limits apply under ideal driving conditions. Unless traffic signs indicate otherwise. 10 miles per hour, in alleys. 30 miles per hour, on urban or town roads. 55 miles per hour, in all other locations that are not specified in this list. In school zones, reduce speed when children are present. In work or construction zones, reduce speed and drive with care. Always obey the posted speed limit. Speed limits and fines. You can be fined for driving a vehicle faster than the posted speed limit. Additional fines will be charged if you are caught driving 20 miles per hour or more over the posted limit. If you are caught driving in excess of 100 miles per hour, your driving privileges will be revoked for a minimum of six months. Reduced speed. You may be required to reduce your speed in many driving situations. It is important to remember that increasing speed decreases your field of vision and puts you at greater risk of being involved in a crash. You must slow down when you approach or pass a stopped emergency vehicle with its emergency lights flashing. A surcharge of not less than $25 is added to the speeding fine if you violate this law. Slow down. For a flag person, pedestrians, barricades, and flares or reflectors on the road. Bad weather and poor road conditions are other situations in which drivers are required to slow down. Slower speeds are necessary when you travel on a narrow or winding road or approach a curve, hilltop, or railroad crossing. When driving on gravel or dirt, you need to slow down. It will take you much longer to stop on gravel or dirt and it is much easier to skid when turning. Speed limits on bridges. Watch for and obey special speed limits and no passing signs posted on bridges. Signaling. When you wish to change lanes or make a turn, signal with an approved signal device to inform other motorists of your intention. Signals are to be activated at least 100 feet before you make the turn. Continue signaling until you have completed the turn or lane change. Hand and arm signals. During daylight hours, hand and arm signals may be used in addition to, or instead of, turn signals. You may not use hand signals at night or while driving a vehicle constructed or loaded so that hand signals are not visible to other drivers. Traffic lanes. A traffic lane is part of a street or highway wide enough to permit safe operation of a vehicle or line of vehicles. You are in a traffic lane whenever driving on any street or highway. Often lanes are not marked, but they are there whether marked or not. You must drive within a single traffic lane, without weaving from one lane to another or straddling the lane marking. Changing Lanes it is often necessary to change lanes in order to make a turn, merge with other traffic, or to perform other driving activities. Lane changing can be dangerous and must be done with caution. 
make sure you have safe clearance to the side, behind, and ahead of your vehicle, before moving into another lane. Turn your head in the direction of the lane you are moving into and check for vehicles. If you rely only on mirrors, you may not see vehicles in certain positions, known as blind spots. Blind spots Blind spots are areas around your vehicle where your view is obstructed. You cannot see pedestrians or other vehicles in your rear view or side mirrors when they are in these locations. The design of your vehicle and the position of the pillars that support the roof will determine the location of your blind spots. Factors such as dirty windshields and glaring lights can also create temporary blind spots. It is important to know the location of your blind spots. Before making lane changes or turns, quickly turn your head to look for hidden pedestrians or vehicles. Avoid driving in other drivers' blind spots. Be particularly conscious of blind spots when driving near commercial vehicles. Turns Improper turns cause many traffic crashes. Move safely into the correct lane well ahead of the place where you will make the actual turn. Slow down before making turns. Signal your intent at least 100 feet before the turn. Signals let pedestrians and drivers know what you plan to do. Multiple turn lanes. If there are signs or lane markings that allow for two or more turning lanes, stay in your lane during the turn. While waiting to turn, keep your wheel straight and your foot on the brake. If your vehicle is struck from the rear, you will be less likely to be pushed into oncoming traffic. Continue signaling until you begin your turn. Do not make sudden turns from the wrong lane of traffic. Watch for traffic or obstacles in the road you plan to enter. Always finish your turn in the correct lane. See diagrams on pages 24 and 25. If the car ahead of you is signaling for a left turn, slow down and prepare to stop. When waiting to make a left turn at a green traffic light with oncoming traffic, position the car into the intersection where your body appears even with the curb line. The only opportunity to make a left turn may occur when the green light changes to yellow. Turning on a red light. Right turn. At many intersections, you may make a right turn while the traffic light is red. Make sure you are in the correct lane and come to a complete stop. No turn on red signs are posted where these turns are not allowed. Check for pedestrians and traffic in all directions to make sure your path is clear. Watch for oncoming cars making left turns in front of you. Sometimes oncoming traffic will have a green arrow before your light turns green. Left turn. If certain conditions are met, you may make a left turn from a one-way street onto another one-way street while the traffic light is red. Before turning, you must first come to a complete stop, make sure the intersection is clear, and yield to any pedestrians or vehicles. Traffic must be permitted to travel in the direction in which you are turning. When turning on a red light, yield to traffic and pedestrians. When a no turn on red sign is posted at an intersection, you must wait until the light is green to make a turn. Roundabouts Roundabouts are designed to increase traffic flow and provide a safer intersection than a normal four-way stop. When approaching a roundabout, slow down as you approach the roundabout. For multi-lane roundabouts, as with any intersection, get into the appropriate lane as you approach the roundabout. Yield to pedestrians and bicyclists crossing the roadway. Watch for signs or pavement markings that require or prohibit certain movements. When entering a roundabout, yield to vehicles already in the roundabout. Do not cross into the roundabout until all traffic from the left has cleared. After entering the roundabout, drive in a counterclockwise direction until you reach your exit. Do not stop, pass, or change lanes within a roundabout. If an emergency vehicle approaches, exit the roundabout immediately and then pull over. A vehicle with a total length that exceeds 40 feet, a total width in excess of 10 feet, or any combination vehicles, may deviate from the lane to the extent necessary to approach and drive through a roundabout when using due regard for all other traffic. In multiple lane roundabouts, if two vehicles with a total length in excess of 40 feet, a total width of 10 feet, 
or any combination of vehicles, approach and drive through a roundabout at approximately the same time or so closely as to potentially collide, the operator of the vehicle on the right must yield the right of way to the vehicle or combination of vehicles on the left, and if necessary, reduce speed or stop. J-turns J-turns are used to decrease fatalities and injuries caused by broadside crashes on four-lane divided highways. Crossing a divided highway using a J-turn. Left-hand turn onto divided highway using a J-turn. At a J-turn, also known as a reduced conflict intersection, drivers on the side street approaching the divided highway always make a right turn. To cross the highway or make a left turn from the side street, come to a complete stop, then turn right onto the highway. Enter the designated left turn lane that leads to the median opening and complete a U-turn. When making the right turn, you are allowed to cross both lanes and move into the left turn lane in one motion, when it is safe to do so, to minimize the amount of time in through lanes of the divided highway. When you are completing the U-turn, you must yield to oncoming traffic and stop if necessary, before entering the through lanes of the divided highway. Divided Highway Crossing a rural divided highway can be a dangerous maneuver. If there is enough space between the two separate roadways, it is acceptable to cross over just one half and wait in the middle until you are sure it is safe to cross the second roadway. If there is no traffic from either direction, a driver could cross over both roadways if safe. When traveling between the separate roadways, keep to the right of the center. When turning left onto a divided highway, the same procedure can be used as crossing straight across, but make sure that there is enough space from oncoming traffic so that they are not impeded as you get up to speed after completing your turn. U-Turns A U-turn is a 180-degree turn, resembling the letter U, that reverses your direction of travel. You may not make a U-turn unless you can do so without disrupting other traffic. No U-turn signs are posted in locations where these turns are not allowed. U-turns are not allowed on interstate freeways. U-turns are also illegal near the tops of hills and on curves where other drivers cannot see you from 1,000 feet away. When necessary to accommodate vehicle configuration on a roadway with two or more lanes in the same direction, a driver may turn the vehicle into the farthest lane and temporarily use the shoulder to make a U-turn. Right-hand lane travel when operating a motor vehicle on a roadway with one lane in the direction of travel, a driver that is proceeding at a speed that is sufficiently low as to create a traffic hazard must drive as close as practicable to the right-hand curb or edge of the roadway. When operating a motor vehicle on highways that are divided into more than one lane in the same direction, you should drive in the right-hand lane when available. If traveling in the leftmost lane, a driver must move out of the lane to allow another vehicle to pass when practical under existing conditions. This does not apply. When overtaking and passing another vehicle proceeding in the same direction. When preparing for a left turn at an intersection or into a private road or driveway. When preparing to exit an expressway, freeway, or interstate highway on the left side of the road. When the vehicle is an authorized emergency vehicle. When otherwise directed by an official traffic control device, a peace officer, or in a highway work zone. Passing Improper passing causes many crashes. Use extra caution when passing at night, when visibility is poor, and when the road is slippery. In locations where passing is permitted on two-lane roads with traffic moving in both directions, you may pass on the left side of vehicles ahead of you. You should not exceed the speed limit to complete a pass. However, the speed limit on two-lane highways with a posted speed limit of 55 miles per hour or higher is increased by 10 miles per hour when the driver is lawfully passing another vehicle in the same direction. When you are preparing to pass, you must make sure there is a safe distance between your vehicle and oncoming traffic. You must also look behind you to determine whether other drivers are preparing to pass you. When another driver is trying to pass you, stay in your own lane and do not increase speed. Use your left turn signal before moving into the left lane to pass. Use your right turn signal after passing and before returning to the right lane. Return to the right lane when you can see the entire vehicle you have just passed in your rearview mirror.
when passing another vehicle, you must return to the right side of the road before coming within 100 feet of an oncoming vehicle. Do not attempt to pass another vehicle in locations where a no passing zone sign is posted or where there is a solid yellow line on your side of the center line. Double solid yellow lines mean passing is not allowed by vehicles traveling in either direction. Do not pass. On a curve or hill where you cannot clearly see the road ahead for at least 700 feet. Within 100 feet of an intersection, underpass, tunnel, or railroad crossing. When you are about to meet a vehicle coming toward you from the opposite direction. Passing on the right. The driver of a vehicle may pass on the right of another vehicle only upon the following conditions. When the driver of a vehicle may overtake and pass another vehicle upon the right only under conditions permitting such movement and safety. In no event shall such movement be made by driving in a bicycle lane or onto the shoulder, whether paved or unpaved, or off the pavement or main traveled portion of the roadway. When the vehicle overtaken is making, or about to make, a left turn. Upon a street or highway with unobstructed pavement not occupied by parked vehicles that prevent two or more lanes of moving vehicles to travel in each direction. Upon a one-way street, or upon any roadway on which traffic is restricted to one direction of movement, where the roadway is free from obstructions and of sufficient width for two or more lanes of moving vehicles. Backing up Backing up is not allowed on freeways or expressways, except by drivers of emergency vehicles in the course of duty. Backing up on public roads could result in a charge of reckless or careless driving. If you must back out of a driveway onto a public road, back into the nearest lane and proceed in a forward direction from there. Never back into or across lanes of traffic unless you are sure it is safe to do so. Before you back up, it is advisable to walk around the vehicle to ensure that nothing is behind it. Before backing up, look to the front, sides, and rear. Continue looking out the rear window of your vehicle while backing. Do not depend on your mirrors. Back slowly into the nearest traffic lane. Parking When a vehicle is properly parallel parked, its wheels on the curb side will be positioned no more than 12 inches from the curb. It is recommended that the front wheels be turned toward the curb. Or shoulder, place the vehicle in park and or engage the parking brake. In the event that the vehicle comes out of park or the brakes fail, the wheel position will help the vehicle to roll toward the curb or off of the road, rather than across a traffic lane. Parking is not allowed in the following areas. Within intersections. On a crosswalk or sidewalk. Within 20 feet of a crosswalk at an intersection. Within 30 feet of any flashing light, stop sign, or traffic control signal located at the side of a public road. Within 50 feet of the nearest rail of a railroad crossing. Within 10 feet of a fire hydrant. Alongside or across the street from any excavation site or obstacle if parking would obstruct traffic. At the street end of a driveway. On any bridge. Within any highway tunnel. On the traffic side of any vehicle parked at a curb or at the edge of a highway, known as double parking. Beside a curb that is painted yellow, or where official, no parking, signs are posted. In front of mailboxes, refer to city, slash local ordinances. Exiting a parked vehicle. When you are stopped or parked on the side of a road, you should not open any doors on the vehicle until you have checked to make sure it is safe to do so and will not interfere with other traffic. Look for other vehicles, motorcycles, bicyclists, and pedestrians that may be approaching the side of your vehicle. You should not allow any door on the side of the vehicle closest to moving traffic to remain open longer than necessary to load or unload passengers. Highway Parking Vehicles left on state highways or freeways for any reason must be moved away from the main, traveled portion of the road. If the vehicle cannot be moved, use clearly visible markers or signals to prevent damage to your vehicle and harm to other drivers. Vehicles parked on the highway at night, or any time lights are required, must have at least one white or amber front light and at least one red taillight illuminated. Both lights must be visible from a distance of at least 500 feet.
use parking lights or hazard warning lights to alert other drivers. Headlights on parked vehicles must be set on low beam. Passenger safety. It is the driver's responsibility to make sure that other passengers are safe. Insist that all passengers wear seat belts. Be sure that children are buckled into an age-appropriate child passenger restraint system. Seat belt laws. Of all the safety equipment in your vehicle, the seat belt is most likely to save your life. In Minnesota, motor vehicles must be equipped with seat belts. Seat belt use is mandatory. A properly adjusted and fastened seat belt must be worn by all drivers and passengers in all seating positions, including the back seat. Law enforcement can stop motorists solely for seat belt violations. If you do not wear a seat belt, consider the following. Your chances of being killed or injured in a crash are four times greater. It is possible to be killed in a crash when traveling at speeds as low as 12 miles per hour. Seat belts keep occupants from being ejected from the vehicle in the event of a crash. People who are thrown from vehicles are likely to die or suffer serious injuries. You are not legally required to wear a seat belt if you are. Driving a passenger vehicle in reverse. Occupying a normal seating position in a motor vehicle in which all seat belts are being used by other passengers. In possession of a written certificate from a physician citing medical reasons for seat belt non-use. Driving a motor vehicle while engaged in work that involves frequent exiting and entering of the motor vehicle. This applies only if you do not drive at speeds greater than 25 miles per hour. A rural mail carrier delivering mail for the U.S. Postal Service. Driving or riding in a pickup truck while engaged in farm work. Driving a motor vehicle made before January 1, 1965. Use seat belts correctly. You are more likely to survive a car crash if you use the lap and shoulder belts together. The lap belt should be adjusted to fit snugly across your hip bones or upper thighs. It should never be positioned across the abdomen or the soft part of your stomach. The shoulder belt should be fitted snugly across the chest and middle of the shoulder. If the seat belt is positioned correctly, it is much less likely to contribute to injuries in the event of a crash. Infant and Child Safety Seat Laws the back seat is the safest place in most vehicles and is the recommended place for any child under age 13 to ride. All child safety restraint systems must be federally approved and installed according to manufacturer's instructions. However, infants must ride in a rear-facing child safety restraint system until according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, children should ride in a rear-facing child safety system until they are at least two years of age. Children older than one year of age and who weigh at least 20 pounds may ride facing forward in a high-back booster seat with the harness straps positioned at or above shoulder level. Children should use a forward-facing harnessed seat until they outgrow the weight limit, typically 40 to 60 pounds, depending on the seat. Children under 8 years of age or 4 feet 9 inches tall, who have outgrown a forward-facing harnessed seat, must sit in a belt positioning forward-facing booster seat, used with both adult lap and shoulder belts. The shoulder belt should fit snugly across the chest and shoulder. A child may not use a seat belt alone until he, she is age 8 or 4 feet 9 inches tall. Other Child Passenger Safety Guidelines For your child's protection, never use a safety seat that has been in a crash. Child restraint systems are typically considered expired after six years from the date of manufacture. Some manufacturers now stamp a specific expiration date on the seat. If no date is listed, follow the six-year recommendation. Rear-facing infant seats should never be placed in front of an active airbag. Children should not be held on a passenger's lap while riding in a vehicle. Children should not ride in the cargo area of a truck or station wagon. Never leave children unattended in a vehicle. Never leave children or vulnerable adults alone in a motor vehicle. Some situations that could occur include the following. Unattended occupants could engage the vehicle and become involved in a crash. Temperatures can reach dangerous extremes inside a vehicle. Occupants could die or suffer serious injuries from heat or cold. 
the vehicle could be stolen or broken into by someone who is not aware the vehicle is occupied. Someone could break into the vehicle and abduct or harm the occupants. Leaving your vehicle unattended. Do not invite theft. Lock your doors and take your keys with you. Do not leave the vehicle running. Do not leave the keys in the ignition or elsewhere inside the vehicle. Do not leave valuables or anything that could appear to be of value inside the vehicle. Animal safety. Drivers are responsible for the safety of animals traveling in vehicles and should be aware of the dangers of leaving animals unattended in vehicles during warm weather. Pets should not be left in vehicles, especially on very hot or cold days. Temperature extremes can be very dangerous to animals. Airbags An airbag is a supplemental restraint system. Airbags are intended to work with seat belts to prevent injuries. They are not designed to keep occupants from being ejected. For safety reasons, children under age 13 should always ride in the back seat. Temperature extremes can be very dangerous to animals. Airbag safety suggestions. Try to maintain at least 10 inches between yourself and the steering wheel. Keep your hands on the 8 and 4 o'clock or 9 and 3 o'clock positions on the steering wheel. Avoid the 10 and 2 o'clock position. Keep your thumbs turned out on the steering wheel. Front passenger seats should be moved as far back as possible. Read. Your operator's manual before driving or riding in a vehicle equipped with airbags. For more information about the use of seat belts, airbags, and car safety seats, visit the Department of Public Safety Office of Traffic Safety website at ots.dps.mn.gov. Do not litter. It is illegal to throw items from your vehicle onto streets, roadways, and public or private land. It is illegal to throw, leave, place, or dump any form of offensive or dangerous item, including cigarettes, fireworks, debris, snow, ice, glass, nails, tacks, wire, cans, garbage, papers, ashes, refuse, carcasses, offal, trash or rubbish onto streets, roadways, and public land or on private land without the owner's consent. What to do in a traffic crash If you are involved in a crash, you must take certain actions to ensure safety and compliance with the law. You must stop. Pull out of the driving lane, if possible, onto the shoulder. Turn off the ignition to decrease the risk of fire. Protect yourself and the crash scene. Warn other drivers of danger with emergency warning lights, flares, or flashlight. If someone in the crash is injured or killed, you must call the nearest law enforcement agency or 911 as quickly as possible. If you are qualified, administer first aid. Otherwise, do what you can to make injured persons comfortable. You are required by law to provide a reasonable degree of assistance to crash victims. You must provide your name, address, date of birth and registration number of your vehicle to other drivers involved in the crash and to any law enforcement officer at the scene. You must also show your driver's license to any driver who asks to see it and to any law enforcement officer at the scene. If a person involved in the crash asks for your insurance information, you must provide the name and address of your insurance carrier and the name of your agent. Insurance information must be given to the law enforcement officer investigating the crash. If you do not have this information with you, you must provide it within 72 hours. If a crash results only in property damage, it is not necessary to notify law enforcement. If your vehicle is disabled, have it towed as soon as possible. If you damage property other than a vehicle, you must inform the property owner. Insurance Owners of motor vehicles driven on public roads must carry no fault and liability insurance on their vehicles. Valid proof of insurance must be carried in the vehicle at all times. Failure to provide proof of insurance at the request of a law enforcement officer may lead to revocation of your driver's license and vehicle registration. When driving privileges are revoked for lack of insurance, the driver must pass a written test, pay a $30 reinstatement fee in addition to fines levied by a court or citation, apply for a new driver's license, and submit an insurance certificate issued by the home office of the insurance company. 
Operation of an uninsured motor vehicle can result in a revocation of license plates and registration for the vehicle. The operator's driving privileges may be revoked for up to one year. Anyone who is convicted of operating an uninsured vehicle may be fined up to $1,000 and sentenced to up to 90 days in jail. Motorcycle Insurance Liability insurance for motorcycle drivers in this state must include coverage for property damage and injury to other people with your vehicle. No fault and uninsured driver insurance coverage is optional. Insurance protection is also available for damage, loss, or theft of the motorcycle. Registering your vehicle All motor vehicles owned by Minnesota residents and operated on public roads must be registered with the Department of Public Safety Driver and Vehicle Services Division. You have up to 60 days after becoming a resident to register your vehicle in Minnesota. To register your vehicle, you must bring the current vehicle title or registration card and your driver's license or other valid identification to your local driver and vehicle services deputy registrar's office and pay all fees and taxes associated with registration and title transfer. Once registered, the license plates can be renewed online, by mail, or in person at any deputy registrar's office. Wireless Communication Devices A person may not use a wireless communications device, such as a cell phone, to compose, read or send electronic messages while driving. Electronic messages include emails and text messages. Electronic messaging also includes instant messaging and accessing the Internet. Exceptions include using the device to obtain emergency assistance report a crash or crime, or when the device is solely voice-activated or in hands-free mode. A person who commits two or more violations of using a wireless communications device to compose, read, or send an electronic message when a vehicle is in motion or a part of traffic will be required to pay a $275 fine in addition to the fine specified by the court. Chapter the following laws and safety information pertain to situations involving other vehicles and pedestrians. Stopping A stop sign requires that you come to a complete stop. At a stop sign with a marked stop line, you must stop before the line. At a stop sign with a pedestrian crosswalk, you must stop before entering the crosswalk. When you have stopped, yield the right-of-way to pedestrians, bicyclists, and traffic before proceeding. If your view of the intersection is obstructed, prepare to stop again for traffic or pedestrians in your path. You must also come to a complete stop in the following situations. Before entering a road from an alley, a private driveway, a parking lot, or a parking ramp. Always stop before crossing an adjoining sidewalk or crosswalk. At an intersection or crosswalk with a traffic signal displaying a red light. Wait until the signal changes to green and your path is clear before proceeding. At any intersection or crosswalk, either marked or unmarked where a pedestrian or bicyclist has left the curb and is crossing the roadway. Stay stopped until the pedestrian or bicyclist has passed your lane. At a flashing red traffic light. Treat this as you would a stop sign. At a freeway ramp meter, when the light is red. At a railroad crossing with a stop sign. When a flag person or traffic device directs you to stop. At a bridge that has been raised to open a path for boats to pass beneath it. Stopping for a school bus. School buses are equipped with yellow and red lights that flash alternately to warn drivers that they are stopping to load or unload students. Flashing yellow lights. Flashing yellow lights will be activated at least 100 feet before a school bus stops in a speed zone of 35 miles per hour or less, and at least 300 feet before it stops in a speed zone of more than 35 miles per hour. It is against the law to pass on the right side of a school bus while it is displaying red or yellow flashing lights. Flashing red lights Flashing red lights warn motorists that the school bus is loading or unloading students. When a school bus is stopped with its red lights flashing and its stop arm extended, you must stop your vehicle at least 20 feet from the bus. Oncoming traffic and motorists approaching the bus from behind may not move until the stop arm is retracted and the red lights are no longer flashing. You can be charged with a misdemeanor if you violate either of these laws.
The penalty for this violation is a fine of not less than $500 and withdrawal of your driving privileges. Passing a school bus It is illegal to pass a school bus when its red lights are flashing and its stop arm is extended. You are not required to stop for a school bus with its red lights flashing if it is on the opposite side of a separated roadway. A law enforcement officer with probable cause to believe a driver has violated this law may arrest the driver within four hours of the violation. Vehicle owner may be penalized. When a vehicle is used to violate the school bus stop arm law, the owner or lessee of the vehicle is guilty of a petty misdemeanor. However, if the owner or lessee of the vehicle can prove that another person was driving the vehicle at the time of the stop arm violation, the driver, not the owner or lessee, will be charged with the violation. When you apply for a driver's license, you must certify, by signing the application, that you understand that you must stop for a school bus and are aware of the penalties for violating this law. School Safety Patrol when you see a student safety patrol assisting schoolmates with crossing a street or highway, you must come to a complete stop. You must also stop for adult crossing guards who display a stop sign or flag. It is illegal to drive through a line of children who are crossing the road, even if a school safety patrol is not present. A violation of this law is a misdemeanor. A second violation of this law, within a year, is a gross misdemeanor. School Bus Flagger a school bus flagger may stop and hold vehicles on a street or highway to allow school buses to leave school property. A driver may not proceed after being stopped by a school bus flagger until directed to do so by the flagger or a police officer. Right-of-way and yielding Right-of-way and yielding laws help traffic flow smoothly and safely. They are based on courtesy and common sense. Violation of these laws is a leading cause of traffic crashes. When two vehicles reach an intersection at the same time, and there is no traffic light or signal, the driver of the vehicle on the left must yield to the vehicle on the right. When two vehicles reach an intersection at the same time, and all way stop signs or flashing red traffic lights control the intersection, the driver on the left must yield right of way to the driver on the right. A driver who wishes to make a left turn must yield to vehicles approaching from the opposite direction when these vehicles are in the intersection or are near enough to pose the risk of a crash. When a green arrow signal indicates that a vehicle may enter an intersection to make a left turn, the driver must yield to other vehicles or pedestrians already within the intersection. After yielding, the driver may continue in the direction of the arrow. When two vehicles approach an uncontrolled T intersection, the driver of the vehicle that is turning must yield to all cross traffic. When approaching a public road from a private road or driveway, you must stop and yield to pedestrians and traffic. Drivers in the right lane of traffic must yield right of way to transit and metro mobility buses attempting to merge from a bus stop or shoulder. This includes yielding the right of way to any school bus attempting to enter that lane from a shoulder, a right turn lane, or other location where the school bus has stopped to load or unload passengers. The school bus must use the left turn signal to indicate intent to move into the right-hand lane of traffic. When a funeral procession identifies itself through use of headlights or hazard warning lights, you must yield to the entire procession. Yield the right-of-way to pedestrians crossing at intersections and crosswalks, either marked or unmarked. Yield to emergency vehicles. When an emergency vehicle, such as an ambulance, fire truck, or police car, displaying flashing red lights and sounding a siren or bell approaches your vehicle on a two-way road, you must pull to the right and stop. If you are traveling on a one-way road, you must pull to whichever side is nearest and stop. If you are within an intersection, proceed through it before stopping. Remain stopped until all emergency vehicles have passed. A law enforcement officer with probable cause to believe a driver has violated this law may arrest the driver within four hours of the violation. You are not required to stop if the emergency vehicle that is approaching you is separated from your lane of traffic by a physical barrier such as a fence, wall, or median strip. Passing Parked Emergency Slash Service Vehicles When an emergency vehicle that has its emergency lights flashing is stopped on or next to a road that has two lanes in the same direction, 
the move over law requires that you move to the lane farthest away from the vehicle, if possible to do so safely. Emergency vehicles include tow trucks, ambulances, fire trucks, and police cars. If you are unable to move a lane away, or on a street or highway that only has one lane in your direction of travel, reduce speed and pass with caution. The same procedure applies when approaching stalled or disabled vehicles and passing parked vehicles, such as service patrol vehicles, road maintenance vehicles, utility company vehicles, construction vehicles, postal vehicles, or solid waste and recycling vehicles that are stopped with warning lights activated. Following Firefighting Vehicles Only vehicles traveling on official emergency business are allowed to follow within 500 feet of any firefighting vehicle making an emergency run. Do not drive over an unprotected fire hose unless you are directed to do so by a law enforcement officer or fire department official. Following Other Vehicles the law requires that you maintain a safe distance between your vehicle and the vehicle in front of you. You must be able to stop or turn to avoid a collision. Consider weather, traffic, and road conditions when determining appropriate following distance. Using the three-second rule will help you maintain a safe following distance. See three-second rule in Chapter 6. Careless and Reckless Driving Careless driving is defined as driving or stopping a motor vehicle in a way that endangers the lives and safety of people or property. Reckless driving is defined as driving a motor vehicle while aware of and consciously disregarding a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the driving may result in harm to another or another's property, including racing or contest driving. Racing is defined as willful comparison or contest of relative speeds by operating one or more vehicles regardless of whether the speed is greater than the speed limit. If you are charged with careless or reckless driving, you will be tried in court for a misdemeanor. What to do and expect when stopped by law enforcement Being stopped by a law enforcement officer can be a stressful experience, but knowing what to do during the traffic stop will help to ensure a safe interaction for all involved. When you see emergency lights behind you, stay calm. Slow your vehicle and activate your turn signal. As soon as safely possible, pull to the right shoulder, or if on a multi-lane road and closer to the left shoulder, move to the left shoulder if there is a full lane to park. Avoid stopping on a bridge, curved part of a roadway, or within the lane of traffic. If the stop is made after dark, turn on your vehicle's interior light. Keep all doors shut and remain in the vehicle unless directed otherwise by the officer. Keep your hands on the steering wheel so they are easily observable. Give the officer your full attention. Do not make sudden movements or search for your driver's license or vehicle documents. Wait for the officer to give you instructions. If you have a weapon or firearm in the vehicle, inform the officer upon your first interaction with them. The officer may ask to see your identification, driver's license, photo ID, etc., and proof of insurance. If the documents are out of reach, tell the officer where they are located before reaching for them. When the officer completes their interaction with you, they may issue a verbal warning, written warning, or traffic citation that may include a fine. If you disagree with the officer's decision to issue a traffic citation, do not prolong the contact by arguing with the officer. If you wish to contest the citation, you will have the opportunity to explain your point of view in court. If clarifying questions are needed about the warning or citation, ask the officer before the interaction is completed and avoid getting out of your vehicle after the officer walks away. Failure to follow or refusal to comply with any lawful order or direction of a law enforcement officer is illegal and can result in being arrested. Do not resist if taken into custody by law enforcement. The enforcement of traffic laws is an effective tool in changing unsafe driving behavior reducing crashes and injuries, and saving lives. If a law enforcement officer gives you a warning or a citation for a traffic violation, their intent is to deter future illegal and or unsafe behavior and to keep our roadways safe. Effective and clear communication from all involved parties can make a traffic stop a safe experience. In addition to the guidelines above, if you have a firearm in the vehicle, Keep your hands on the steering wheel in a visible location and when the officer approaches, 
let them know that you have a firearm in the vehicle. And tell them where the firearm is located while continuing to keep your hands on the steering wheel. Do not reach for the firearm. The officer may take possession of the weapon for safety reasons until the contact is complete. Drivers should not reach around inside the vehicle. If you need to reach for an item, contact the officer verbally to indicate the item that you need to locate and only do so after the officer has given verbal permission. Get out of the vehicle unexpectedly or approach the officer. If you need to exit your vehicle, contact the officer verbally to ask to exit the vehicle and only exit after the officer has given verbal permission to do so. While every traffic stop varies based on the circumstances, drivers can generally expect the officer to greet the driver, identify themselves as a law enforcement officer, obtain the driver's license and proof of insurance, inform the individual of the reason for the stop and explain the circumstances for issuance of the citation or warning, check both the validity and authenticity of the driver's license. The following forms of identification are acceptable in identifying the driver during a traffic stop. Minnesota Driver's License Out-of-State Driver's License Temporary License Learner's Permit Military ID Consulate-slash-International Driver's License Depending on the nature of the stop, the officer may issue a citation or warning or take a violator into custody. The citation should contain the specific code or statute and a description of the violation. Accepting a citation from an officer is not an admission of guilt or responsibility, it's simply acknowledging the receipt of the citation in the case of a civil violation and promising to appear in the case of a criminal violation. All citations will be referred to a local jurisdiction for a hearing. Drivers can use the court system to address criminal or civil matters with the option of a diversion program in some cases, such as driver education training. Law enforcement officers are expected to maintain the highest level of professionalism during a traffic stop. Should questions arise regarding the officer's conduct during a traffic stop, drivers should contact the officer's law enforcement agency or supervisor using the officer information on the citation. Fleeing a police officer Fleeing a police officer in a motor vehicle is illegal and dangerous. Anyone who violates this law is guilty of a felony and may be sentenced to imprisonment for not more than three years and one day, a fine of not more than $5,000, or both. If someone is killed or injured, the driver fleeing may be sentenced as follows. If a death results while fleeing a law enforcement officer, the driver may be sentenced to imprisonment for not more than 10 years find not more than $20,000, or both. If great bodily harm results while fleeing a law enforcement officer, the driver may be sentenced to imprisonment for not more than seven years, find not more than $14,000, or both. If substantial bodily harm results, the driver may be sentenced to imprisonment for not more than five years, find not more than $10,000, or both. Watch for pedestrians. Whether you are driving on busy city streets, in rural towns, or on highways, stay alert for pedestrians. Yield the right-of-way to pedestrians crossing at intersections and crosswalks. Watch for pedestrians on roads where cars are parked during times of poor visibility and whenever children are present. If a pedestrian is in a marked or unmarked crosswalk, stop and wait until the pedestrian has passed your lane. Watch for blind pedestrians who may be carrying a white or metallic cane or using a guide dog. If a blind pedestrian is waiting at a crosswalk, do not use your horn or rev your engine as this may distract the pedestrian or guide dog. It is illegal to pass another vehicle that has stopped for a pedestrian. If another vehicle has stopped, look for pedestrians that are in the crosswalk and be prepared to stop. A violation of pedestrian right-of-way laws is a misdemeanor. A second violation of these laws, within a year, is a gross misdemeanor. Crosswalks Marked crosswalks have solid white lines on the road and have road signs or flashing lights to warn you that you are approaching a crosswalk. Unmarked crosswalks are areas where a road intersects a sidewalk and there are no solid lines painted on the road. 
When stopping at a marked or unmarked crosswalk, do not block the crosswalk with your vehicle. As a pedestrian, obey the traffic laws designed to keep you safe and help. Driver see you. Obey traffic control signals at intersections. Stay a few feet back from the road when waiting for the walk signal. Yield the right-of-way to vehicles within the intersection at the time the walk signal is activated. Make your intention to cross clear, make eye contact with the driver and ensure the driver is yielding the right-of-way to you before proceeding. Use sidewalks when they are available and in usable condition. When crossing a road with no crosswalks, yield to all vehicles on the road. Stay out of traffic lanes, when possible, and make way for traffic on the road. If it is necessary to walk on the road, stay on the left side or face oncoming traffic. When walking at night or in poor visibility conditions, wear light-colored clothing trimmed with reflective material or carry a flashlight to help drivers see you. Be prepared to avoid drivers who do not see you. Pedestrians have the right-of-way within intersections and crosswalks, but motorists may not see you in time to stop. Even in normal weather conditions, glare from the sun and other factors can make it difficult for drivers to see the road ahead and to spot pedestrians in time to stop. Sharing the road with bicyclists Bicycles are legal vehicles on Minnesota roads, and they share the same rights and responsibilities as other vehicles. Bicycle lanes are designed to separate bicycle traffic from normal vehicle traffic. It is illegal to drive in these lanes except to park, when permitted, to enter or leave the road, or to prepare for a turn. Before crossing a bicycle lane, make sure it is safe to do so. Yield the right-of-way to approaching bicyclists. When the bicycle lane is clear, signal your intention to turn and then move into the bicycle lane before making the turn. Use caution when passing a bicyclist. When passing, the law requires at least three feet between the side of your car and the bicyclist. When passing a bicyclist, make sure the bicyclist is not signaling or making a left turn. When passing a bicyclist, a driver is allowed to cross the center of the roadway even when marked as a no-passing zone when it is safe to do so. Bicycle Laws Bicycle riders are required to obey all traffic laws. Bicyclists must ride in the same direction as the flow of traffic, not against it. Bicyclists must signal all turns and obey all traffic control signs slash signals and devices. Bicyclists who approach a stop sign must slow to a speed that allows for stopping before entering the intersection or the nearest crosswalk. If there is not a vehicle in the vicinity, the operator may make a turn or proceed through the intersection without stopping. Bicyclists use the same hand and arm signals as other drivers use, but they may also hold their right arm straight out to indicate a right turn. Bicyclists should travel just to the right of faster-moving traffic. However, certain hazards such as rough surfaces, debris, drainage grates, or a narrow traffic lane may require bicyclists to move toward the center of the lane. Bicyclists may also move out in the lane when passing another vehicle or when making a left turn. Bicyclists are allowed to ride two abreast as long as they do not impede traffic, and when on a laned roadway, must ride within a single lane. Bicyclists are encouraged to wear helmets. Bicyclists are required to be equipped with legal lights and reflectors when riding at night. A bicycle may be equipped with a front lamp that emits a white flashing signal, or a rear lamp that emits a red flashing signal, or both. A bicycle may be equipped with tires having studs, spikes, or other protuberances designed to increase traction. When riding a bicycle on a sidewalk or across a roadway on a crosswalk, yield the right-of-way to pedestrians and give an audible signal before passing them. You may not ride a bicycle on a sidewalk within a business district, unless permitted by local authorities. Local authorities may also prohibit bicyclists from riding on any sidewalk or crosswalk. Bicyclists operating a bicycle on a sidewalk or crosswalk have all the rights and duties of pedestrians. In 2010, the Minnesota legislature amended a law to address instances when two-wheeled vehicles are not detected by control systems at traffic lights, and a signal change does not occur.
the law gives bicyclists the option to proceed through the intersection. After a reasonable amount of time, and provides an affirmative legal defense to this action, based on five conditions. The bicycle has been brought to a complete stop. The traffic control signal continues to show a red light for an unreasonable time. The traffic control signal is apparently malfunctioning or, if programmed to change to a green light only after detecting the approach of a motor vehicle, the signal has apparently failed to detect the bicycle. No vehicle or person is approaching on the roadway to be crossed or entered, or Approaching vehicles or persons are so far away that they do not constitute an immediate hazard. The affirmative defense applies only to an alleged violation for entering or crossing an intersection controlled by a traffic control signal against a red light. It does not provide a defense to any other civil or criminal action. Bicyclists can be difficult to spot in traffic. Watch for them in intersections, on sidewalks, and when you enter or leave alleys and driveways. Watch for bicycle traffic at night. Motorized bicycles a motorized bicycle is defined by its speed capacity, it is capable of traveling at speeds of 30 miles per hour or less. Rules that apply to bicycle riding generally apply to motorized bicycles. Motorized bicycles are not allowed on sidewalks, freeways, or lanes and trails designated for pedestrians and bicycles. Motorcycles Motorcyclists must obey the same traffic laws as other drivers. Because motorcycles are smaller than cars, it can be difficult to judge their speed and distance when they are approaching. Your following distance from a motorcycle should be the same as, or greater than your following distance from other vehicles. Riders may experience difficulty controlling the motorcycle, which could result in weaving. Allow maneuvering room to avoid hitting a motorcyclist. When you prepare to move into a lane in front of a motorcycle, allow the motorcycle as much space from the rear of your vehicle as you would allow a car. If a motorcyclist attempts to pass you, maintain your lane position and speed and allow the rider to complete the pass. Crowding a motorcyclist is illegal and dangerous. Never attempt to drive alongside a motorcycle in the same lane. Motorcycles do not provide the same protection in crashes as other motor vehicles. Crashes at urban intersections are the most common motorcycle. Car collisions Many occur when drivers fail to yield right-of-way and make a left turn in front of an oncoming motorcycle. Right-of-way laws apply to motorcyclists as well as other drivers. Motorcyclists may use high-occupancy vehicle lanes. Neighborhood Electric Vehicles, NEV an NEV is an electric-powered vehicle that has three or four wheels and can reach a speed of at least 20, but not more than 25 miles per hour. NEVs must be titled and registered with DVS. Anyone with a Class D driver's license may drive an NEV, but only on streets with speed limits of 35 miles per hour or less. NEVs may not be used during a road test. Commercial Vehicles a commercial vehicle is a motor vehicle or combination of motor vehicles weighing more than 26,000 pounds that is used to transport passengers or property. Buses, including school buses of all sizes, and smaller vehicles that have hazardous materials, placards, are also commercial vehicles. Passing a commercial vehicle Before passing a commercial vehicle, make sure you have safe clearance to the side, behind, and ahead of your vehicle. On a level highway, it takes 3 to 5 seconds longer to pass a commercial vehicle than a car. Allow enough time to pass the commercial vehicle and return to the right lane before coming within 100 feet of approaching traffic. Do not pass a commercial vehicle if you plan to exit or turn off from the roadway soon. Rather than making an unsafe pass, remain behind the commercial vehicle until you reach the exit. On an upgrade, commercial vehicles often lose speed, making them easier to pass than a car. On a downgrade, a commercial vehicle's momentum will increase its speed. You may need to allow more distance to pass. Complete your pass as quickly as possible and do not remain alongside the commercial vehicle. Move back into your lane only when you can see the front of the commercial vehicle in your rearview mirror. Maintain your speed after passing a commercial vehicle. 
When a commercial vehicle passes your vehicle, you can assist the driver by keeping to the far side of your lane and slightly reducing speed. Do not speed up while the commercial vehicle is passing. When you meet a commercial vehicle coming from the opposite direction, stay as far to the right as possible to avoid a sideswipe crash and to reduce wind turbulence between the two vehicles. Turbulence will push the vehicles away from each other, not toward each other. Because of their large size, commercial vehicles often appear to be traveling at slower speeds than they actually are. Many car commercial vehicle collisions occur at intersections because the driver of the car misjudges the speed and distance of the commercial vehicle. Lane changing in front of commercial vehicles Changing lanes and cutting in too close in front of another vehicle is always dangerous, but it's especially dangerous to cut off a commercial bus or truck. If you move in quickly from either side, you're likely to be in a blind spot so the driver may not see you in time. Even if you're visible, the vehicle may not be able to slow quickly enough to avoid a crash because of the amount of time it takes to stop. Following a commercial vehicle Commercial vehicles require greater stopping distance than cars. An average passenger car traveling at 55 miles per hour can stop within 130 to 140 feet. A fully loaded tractor trailer may require more than 400 feet to come to a complete stop. Following a commercial vehicle too closely reduces your ability to see the road ahead. Maintain a safe following distance and position your vehicle so the driver can see you in the side mirrors. Maintaining a safe following distance will also allow you time to react if the commercial vehicle must stop suddenly. Commercial vehicles have large side mirrors that can reflect light. When you follow a commercial vehicle at night, always dim your headlights to avoid blinding the driver. When a commercial vehicle merges into traffic, it requires more time. Then a car to accelerate and reach normal speed. Be prepared to slow down or change lanes, if necessary, to allow the truck to merge safely. If you come to a stop behind a commercial vehicle on an upgrade, allow space for the truck to roll back slightly when it begins to move. Position your vehicle on the left side of your lane to allow the driver to see you in. The Side Mirror Commercial Vehicles and Wide Turns Pay close attention to commercial vehicles' turn signals. Many commercial vehicles make wide right turns and must sometimes leave an open space to the right just before the turn. The rear wheels of a turning vehicle follow a shorter path than the front wheels, the longer the vehicle, the greater the difference. To avoid a collision, do not pass a commercial vehicle on the right side if there is a possibility that it might make a right turn. Commercial Vehicle No Zones If you are following a commercial vehicle, stay out of its no zones. These zones are blind spots to the front, sides, and rear of the vehicle. Some truck drivers may not be able to see up to 20 feet in front of the cab, on either side of the trailer, and up to 200 feet to the rear. Patience around commercial vehicles Trucks and buses have operating restrictions, and sometimes use technology like speed limiters. Honking, driving aggressively, or weaving through traffic won't make the trip faster but can cause dangerous distractions and crashes. Railroad Crossings Railroad crossings can be especially dangerous places for collisions to occur. Because of the size and weight of a train, most vehicle train collisions are deadly for the motor vehicle driver. This is a good reason for drivers to pay extra attention for trains or other on-track equipment when approaching and crossing railroad tracks. Railroad Crossing Warning Devices Public railroad crossings are marked with warning devices designed to let drivers know when railroad tracks are present. Warning signs and pavement markers indicate that you are approaching a railroad crossing. Signs located near the track will indicate how many tracks are present. When approaching a crossing, observe the tracks carefully and be prepared to stop when you see these markings. Flashing lights, bells, and gates indicate that a train or other on-track equipment is approaching. When you see these lights or gates activated, do not proceed across the tracks. Stop your vehicle at least 10 feet from the nearest rail or gate. It is safe to cross when traffic ahead has moved and you can proceed without stopping within 10 feet past the rails. 
At some crossings, a flag person may control traffic while a train or other on-track equipment is approaching. Obey the flag person as you would a warning device. Special vehicles at railroad crossings. Some vehicles, such as passenger vans, buses, and larger trucks are required to stop at all railroad tracks, whether or not a train is present. Do not pass these vehicles. It is illegal to pass any vehicle within 100 feet of a railroad crossing. Railroad Crossing Safety More than one train may approach at the same time from different directions. When the last car of a train passes, do not proceed across the tracks until you are sure a second train is not approaching on another track. Look for trains in both directions at every railroad crossing, whether or not there are warning devices. When there is heavy traffic on both sides of a crossing, wait behind the tracks until you are sure you can make it to the other side without stopping on the tracks. Never race a train to get to the other side of the crossing. Trains cannot. Stop as quickly as motor vehicles. If you misjudge a train's speed or your vehicle becomes stuck, you may be killed or severely injured. Do not shift. Gears while your vehicle is within a crossing. If your vehicle has a manual transmission, shift down before entering the crossing. Motorcyclists should approach railroad crossings with caution. Do not swerve to get a better angle for crossing. Swerving may cause you to enter into a lane of oncoming traffic. Although trains are equipped with bright lights and loud horns, their distance and speed is difficult to judge, particularly at night. If you feel hesitation about crossing railroad tracks when a train is in sight, stop. Wait for the train to pass before proceeding across the tracks. You should never stop on railroad tracks. Emergency Notification System, ENS, for Highway Rail Grade Crossings Every highway rail crossing has an emergency notification system, ENS, sign that provides a 24-7-365 telephone number to call to report problems or emergencies at. The Railroad Location The blue-colored ENS sign is located on the railroad crossing posts or the metal control box near the tracks. The ENS is for those emergencies that would require stopping train traffic due to an obstruction or any other problem at the crossing. By providing the DOT number on the sign, the dispatchers know exactly where the grade crossing is and can notify trains moving in that direction to either come to a stop or be placed on a speed restriction. Highway Work Zones Highway work zones are areas where road construction or maintenance work is underway. Machinery operates day and night and can be moving or stationary. Road workers set up zones, with signs and road markings, to direct traffic. Motorists must be able to understand and react to these directions. Remember to be patient and expect delays, especially during peak travel times. Reduce your speed, watch out for workers and equipment, and follow any flag person's directions. Failure to obey a flag person in a work zone will result in a violation and financial penalty. Reduced speed limits are posted in many work zones. If there are no reduced speed limit postings, obey the posted speed limit. Disobeying the speed limit in a work zone will result in a violation and financial penalty. Watch for workers and equipment and adjust your lane position to keep a safe distance away. Late Merge, Zipper Merge the zipper merge is a new driving strategy that requires a change in the mindset of motorists who traditionally have been taught to merge early when recognizing that a lane will end. The results of early merging are longer backups, an increase in crashes and road rage incidents. The new driving procedure to follow is when you see the lane closed ahead sign and traffic is backing up, stay in your current lane up to the point of merge. Then take turns with other drivers to safely and smoothly. Ease into the remaining lane. When traffic is heavy and slow, it is much safer for motorists to remain in their current traffic lane until the point where traffic can orderly take turns merging. The zipper merge benefits drivers by Reducing the difference in speeds between two lanes. Changing lanes when traffic is traveling at approximately the same speed is easier and safer. Reducing the overall length of traffic backup by as much as 40%. Reducing congestion on freeway interchanges, especially in the metropolitan area. 
creating a sense of fairness and equity that all lanes are moving at the same rate. Reducing Incidents of Road Rage Chapter Minnesota Signs Signals and pavement markings conform to national standards. They are intended to provide clear instructions to help you drive safely. Learn to recognize and understand traffic signs, signals, and pavement markings. Signs Road signs use uniform symbols and pictures, as well as written instructions. The shapes and colors of signs are coded to give you a general idea of what the sign says, even before you are close enough to read it. Sign color meanings Regulatory Red, prohibits and commands white, regulates. Warning Yellow, warns. Yellow-green, warns and controls in pedestrian and bicycle crossings and school areas. Orange, warns and controls in construction zones. Informational Green, guides and informs. Blue, describes services for motorists. Brown, indicates historic, cultural or recreation sites. Common shapes Pentagon crossbuck circle Rectangle Regulatory signs Regulatory signs direct drivers to follow certain traffic laws. You must obey these signs in order to drive in a safe and lawful manner. If you do not obey these signs, you may be issued a traffic citation that may impose a fine. Stop. Come to a complete stop. Remain stopped until pedestrians and vehicles with the right of way have cleared the intersection. Then proceed with caution. Yield. Slow down or stop, if necessary. Give the right of way to all other vehicles and pedestrians, and wait until it is safe to proceed. Do not enter. Do not enter that lane or road if this sign is facing you. Wrong way. You have entered a lane of oncoming traffic. You are traveling in the wrong direction. No left turn, no right turn, no U-turn, no parking. A red circle with a red slash mark across a symbol indicates that you should not take a certain course of action. Speed limit. Speed limit signs indicate the maximum speed at which you may drive on an area of road. Minimum speed limits are usually posted on interstate freeways with controlled access. Do not drive slower than the minimum posted limit unless bad weather or poor road conditions make it necessary. Do not pass. Marks the beginning of a no-passing zone. One way. Traffic in the specified lane flows only in the direction of the arrow. Keep right. Stay to the right of a traffic island, median, or obstruction ahead. Roundabout. When approaching a multi-lane roundabout, get in the appropriate lane well in advance of the roundabout. Lane use signs will always show which lanes can be used for different turns. In this example, to turn right, get into the right lane only, and to turn left, get into the left lane only. The sign shows that you can go straight from either lane. Lane use control signs. Turning is required or specified from a specific lane. Traffic in the right lane may proceed straight ahead or turn. No turn on red. Wait for the traffic signal to turn green before you turn. Warning signs. Center lane only. The center lane is shared, for the purpose of making left turns, by traffic traveling in both directions. Reduced speed ahead. A slower speed limit is posted ahead. Begin reducing your speed. Restricted Lane The diamond symbol indicates that the traffic lane is reserved for a specific use or a certain type of vehicle. The lane may be designated for cars with two or more passengers or for bus, commercial vehicle, or bicycle use. Handicapped Parking Parking spaces posted with a blue handicapped parking sign are reserved for vehicles displaying disability license plates or a disability parking permit. When designed disability parking spaces are either occupied or unavailable, a vehicle displaying a valid disability parking permit or license plates may park at an angle and occupy two standard parking spaces. Warning signs alert you to possible hazards ahead. 
For your own safety and the safety of others, you must be able to recognize them and react. Most warning signs are yellow. Signs warning of pedestrian or bicycle crossings and school zones may be either yellow or fluorescent yellow-green. Some common warning signs are shown below. Railroad crossings. Warning signs, pavement markings, gates, and flashing red lights are positioned at most railroad crossings. Pavement markings include a stop line, an X, and the letters RR painted on the pavement in front of the crossing. An X-shaped sign identifies a railroad crossing. If there is more than one track, a sign below the crossbuck indicates the number of tracks. An exempt sign means that bus and truck drivers who are usually required to stop at railroad crossings may proceed without stopping. Drivers still need to look in both directions for trains. Railroad crossings. These signs alert motorists that a railroad crossing is ahead. Slow down. Look carefully in both directions and be prepared to stop. Remember, trains cannot stop quickly. School zone. These yellow or fluorescent yellow-green, pentagon-shaped warning signs indicate that a school or an approved school crosswalk is ahead. Watch for children and be prepared to stop. School crossing. Watch for children in crosswalk and be prepared to stop. Drivers must yield to all pedestrians in crosswalks. The school crossing sign with the arrow below is the standard marking. Pedestrian crossing. These signs direct drivers to watch for pedestrians crossing the road. Slow down and be prepared to stop for pedestrians. Yield the right of way to pedestrians crossing at intersections and crosswalks. The pedestrian crossing sign with the arrow below is the standard marking. No passing zone. This sign is on the left side of a two-way highway. It warns of the beginning of a no passing zone. Slow moving vehicle emblem. This emblem must be displayed on all vehicles that travel at speeds of 30 miles per hour or less, such as farm implements or animal-drawn vehicles, when they are making use of a public road. Adjust your vehicle speed or prepare to change lanes when you see this sign. Animal-drawn vehicle. Be alert for slow-moving, animal-drawn vehicles on the roadway. Reduce your speed and pass slowly. Animal-drawn vehicles are required to have a light or lamp visible within 500 feet from sunset to sunrise, or during periods of reduced visibility, inclement weather, or insufficient light. Intersection Warning Signs Crossroad An intersection is ahead. Prepare to yield. Side Road Traffic is coming from your right. Watch for vehicles entering the roadway. T-intersection ahead. The road you are traveling on will end soon. Prepare to turn right or left. Yield to cross traffic. Y intersection ahead. The road ahead splits into two different directions. Be prepared for traffic crossing in your path and prepare to turn in one direction or the other. Curve. The road curves in the direction indicated. If the sign displays a speed limit, slow to the indicated speed. Roundabout. As you approach a roundabout, slow down to the advisory speed and prepare to stop if necessary. Winding road ahead. The road ahead winds back and forth. Slow to a safe or indicated speed. Two way traffic ahead. You are leaving a one way road and entering a two way road. Stay to the right. Divided highway begins. The road is dividing. Stay to the right. No longer be divided by a center island. The road ahead sharply changes direction. Crossing signs warn drivers to Lane ends. Two lanes will become one. In this example, vehicles in the right lane must merge into left lane traffic. Right lane vehicles must yield. Merging traffic. Vehicles merge onto the roadway on which you are traveling. Be prepared to allow vehicles to enter. Added lane. The roadway will gain an additional lane of traffic. New traffic will not have to merge. Low clearance ahead. Do not proceed if your vehicle is taller than the height indicated on the sign, 
or your vehicle may become stuck. Narrow Bridge The bridge ahead is narrower than the roadway. Construction Signs Orange signs with black letters are used in construction and work zones. Slow down when You see an orange sign. These signs warn drivers of restricted lanes of traffic, detours, and other road work hazards. Drums, cones, tubes, flashing arrows, and orange and white striped barriers are all used to keep traffic out of a construction area or areas where it is dangerous to drive. You may also see people holding orange signs, flags, or stop signs, giving directions in work zones. Always follow their directions. Indicates that a person with a flag is ahead. Drive cautiously. Indicates that workers are performing maintenance on the roadway. Reduce speed and adjust lane position away from workers. Reduced speeds are often posted in work zones. Motorists who violate the posted speed limit in work zones when workers are present will be assessed a $300 fine. Historic, cultural, and recreational signs. Brown signs point out historic sites, parks, and other points of interest. Motorist services signs. Blue signs direct you to services such as telephones, gas, food, motels, hospitals, and rest areas. Traffic control signals are used at intersections where traffic volume is high. Signals promote safety and orderly flow of traffic. If a traffic signal is not functioning, treat the intersection as you would an uncontrolled intersection. Intersection Gridlock A driver shall not enter an intersection controlled by a traffic control signal until the driver is able to move the vehicle immediately, continuously, and completely through the intersection without impeding or blocking the movement of cross-traffic. This does not apply to movement of a vehicle when Directed by a traffic control agent or a peace officer. Moving to allow the passing of an authorized emergency vehicle with its lights activated, or Making a turn that allows the vehicle to safely leave the intersection. A steady red light means stop. Stop and wait for the light to change. Come to a complete stop at the stop line, before the crosswalk, or before entering the intersection. After stopping, you may make a right turn when the intersection is clear, if traffic is permitted to travel in that direction. If a no turn on red sign is posted at an intersection, you must wait for the light to turn green. If certain conditions are met, you may make a left turn from a one-way roadway onto a one-way cross street while the traffic light is red. Before turning, you must first come to a complete stop, make sure the intersection is clear, and yield to any pedestrians or other vehicles. Traffic must be permitted to travel only in the direction in which you are turning. A red arrow means stop. You must come to a complete stop at the stop line, before the crosswalk, or before entering the intersection. When the arrow turns green, you may proceed in the direction it indicates. Treat a flashing red light as you would a stop sign. Come to a complete stop, yield to vehicles and pedestrians who reach the intersection before you and proceed when the intersection is clear. A steady yellow light or arrow means caution. The signal is about to turn red. Do not enter the intersection if you can stop safely before doing so. If you cannot stop safely, proceed through the intersection with caution. If you are waiting in the intersection to make a turn and the signal turns from yellow to red, complete the turn as soon as it is safely possible. Do not back up. A flashing yellow light or arrow means caution. Proceed through the intersection with caution. Yield the right of way to vehicles and pedestrians already in the intersection. Vehicles turning left or making a U-turn to the left shall yield the right of way to other vehicles approaching from the opposite direction so closely as to constitute an immediate hazard. A green light. You may begin to cross the intersection as soon as it is clear. Yield to any vehicles or pedestrians in the intersection. When turning left, yield to oncoming traffic. When turning right or left, yield to pedestrians crossing in front of your vehicle. A green arrow means you can safely turn in the direction of the arrow. Your turn should be protected from oncoming or crossing traffic. Pedestrian Signals 
There are stop and go signals for pedestrians. Pedestrians must obey these signals. When the pedestrian or walk signal is visible, pedestrians should look to see if it is safe to cross the intersection before proceeding. Once in the intersection, pedestrians may continue walking to the other side of the roadway. When the raised hand or don't walk signal is flashing, pedestrians should not begin to cross the intersection. Pedestrians who are already in the intersection may continue walking to the other side of the roadway at a normal pace. When a steady raised hand or don't walk signal is visible, pedestrians should not attempt to cross the intersection. Pedestrians who are already in the intersection should walk to the nearest safe location as quickly and as safely as possible. Lane Use Control Signals these signals allow lanes to be used by traffic from different directions at different times. Drivers must also follow all other traffic signs and signals that apply. A steady downward green arrow means you are allowed to drive in the lane below the green arrow. A steady yellow X means you should prepare to move into another lane in a safe manner. A lane control change is being made in the lane below the steady yellow X. A steady red X will be displayed next and you cannot occupy the lane at that time. A flashing yellow X means you can use the lane below the flashing yellow X to make a left turn. You must use caution because left-turning vehicles from the other direction may be using the same lane. A steady downward yellow arrow means you should prepare to move into another lane in a safe manner. The freeway lane below the steady downward yellow arrow will be closed. A flashing downward yellow arrow means you can use the freeway lane under the flashing downward yellow arrow. Exercise caution in this lane. A steady red X means you cannot drive in the lane under the steady red X signal. Ramp meters are signal lights on freeway entrance ramps that help control the flow of merging traffic. Like traffic signals at intersections, red, yellow, and green lights indicate when drivers can proceed. Only one car may proceed each time the light is green. One car per green light. Used with freeway ramp meters at on-ramps to indicate that one car may proceed each time the light turns green. Pavement markings. Pavement markings direct and regulate traffic. White lines. White lines separate lanes of traffic traveling in the same direction. A line composed of white dashes indicates that drivers can change lanes in areas where this type of marking is present. A line of shorter and thicker white dashes indicates that the lane will end. A solid white line indicates that lane changes are discouraged in areas where this type of marking is present. Solid white lines also mark crosswalks, stop lines at intersections, parking stalls, and the edges of a roadway. Double solid white lines indicate that lane changes are prohibited in areas where this type of marking is present. A solid white line with a bicycle insignia along the side of the road indicates an area is designated for bicycle traffic only. Bicycles must travel in the same direction as adjacent traffic. Yellow lines. Yellow lines separate traffic moving in opposite directions. A solid yellow line indicates that passing is prohibited in areas where this marking is present. Passing in a no-passing zone is illegal. A line composed of yellow dashes indicates that passing is allowed in areas where this type of marking is present. A solid yellow line may appear on one side of the roadway, while a line composed of dashes appears on the other side. Drivers must obey the marking that is present in their lane of traffic. Two solid yellow lines, one in each lane of traffic, indicate that passing is prohibited in both directions. Drivers traveling in both directions are prohibited from crossing the double solid center line in order to pass other vehicles. Lane Markings Road markings can be used to separate lanes reserved for certain actions or types of vehicles. Two-lane road with traffic moving in both directions Traffic is separated by a line of yellow dashes, indicating vehicles traveling in both directions may pass. Two-lane road with traffic moving in both directions. Traffic in the lane with the solid yellow line is prohibited from passing. Two-lane road with traffic moving in both directions. Traffic in both lanes is prohibited from passing. 
road with four lanes, two in each direction separated by two solid yellow lines. Do not cross solid yellow lines to pass. Multiple lane road with traffic moving in both directions separated by a solid traffic divider. No shoulders at inner edges of roadway. Turn lanes. Turn lanes near intersections separate left or right turning traffic from through traffic. White arrows, which may be accompanied by the word only indicate that drivers must stay within a designated lane while turning onto the cross street. If your vehicle is in this type of lane, you must turn. Some turn lanes have multiple arrows, allowing you to turn left or right, or to go straight. To discourage drivers from changing lanes near an intersection, turn lanes are separated from through traffic lanes by solid white lines. Center turn lanes A center lane between lanes of traffic traveling in opposite directions may be designated for left turns only. This type of lane is marked by parallel solid and dashed yellow lines. These lines are sometimes accompanied by white arrows on the pavement. Vehicles traveling in either direction can use these lanes to make left turns onto another roadway or a driveway. Road with three lanes with traffic moving in both directions. Center turn lane is reserved for traffic turning left from both directions. Reversible lanes. Reversible lanes help keep traffic flowing during rush hour periods. They are separated by dashed double yellow lines. You may cross these lines only if the overhead signal above the lane you wish to enter has a green arrow, or if a sign permits you to do so. Carpool lanes Carpool lanes are restricted to vehicles with two or more occupants. They are marked by a diamond symbol or with carpool-only signs. They are usually located on the far left side of a freeway and are separated from other traffic lanes by combinations of white or yellow lines. Warning Markings Pavement messages may be used to warn drivers of certain conditions, such as school zone ahead. Traffic Officers Law enforcement officers and other individuals direct traffic on some occasions. When an officer is present, obey any hand signals you are given rather than traffic signals, signs, or pavement markings. Most traffic officers signal drivers to stop by holding up one hand with the palm facing the vehicle and giving a long blast on the whistle. Officers signal drivers to start or keep moving by motioning with the hand and giving a series of short blasts on the whistle. Officers may signal with a flashlight during low-light conditions. Chapter 6 Driving Conditions This chapter provides guidance on how to drive safely in a variety of conditions. Using the SIPTA system Nothing you do will guarantee that others will see you. The only eyes you can really count on are your own. Experienced drivers make a practice of being aware of what is happening around them. They can create their driving strategy by using a system known as SIPTA. SIPTA is a five-step process used to make appropriate judgments and apply them correctly in different traffic situations. Scan, identify, predict, decide, execute. Let's examine each of these steps. Scan. Search aggressively ahead, to the sides and behind to avoid potential hazards even before they arise. How assertively you search, and how much time and space you have, can eliminate or reduce the impact of a crash. Focus on finding potential escape routes around intersections, shopping areas, schools, and commercial zones. Search for Oncoming traffic that may turn in front of you. Traffic coming from the left and right, including bicycles and pedestrians. Traffic approaching from behind. Hazardous road conditions. Identify. Locate hazards and potential conflicts. Cars, motorcycles, bicycles, pedestrians, or other vehicles may move into your path and increase the likelihood of a crash. Unattended children and animals are unpredictable and make short, fast moves. Stationary objects, potholes, guardrails, bridges, roadway signs, hedges, or trees won't move into your path, but may influence your driving strategy. Predict. Consider speed, distance, and direction of hazards to anticipate how they may affect you. Cars moving into your path are more critical than those moving away or sitting still. 
decide. Based on your prediction, decide what you would need to do if the situation changed quickly. You must be making decisions constantly to cope with constantly changing traffic situations. Execute. Carry out your decision. To create space and minimize harm. Communicate your presence with lights and or horn. Adjust your speed appropriately. Adjust your position and or direction. 3-second rule. Applying the 3-second rule is a way to help keep a safe distance between your car and the vehicle ahead of you. This rule pertains to standard length vehicles driving in ideal conditions. Choose a fixed reference point at the side of the road ahead, such as a telephone pole, signpost, tree, or bridge. When the vehicle ahead of you passes the reference point, begin counting, 1001, 1002, 1003. If you pass the reference point before you are through counting, you are following too closely. Gradually slow down until you have reached a safe following distance and speed. When road conditions are poor, or if you are driving a vehicle that is longer than the standard length, increase your following distance to a 4 or 5 second count. If the vehicle behind you is following too closely, slow down slightly and allow it to pass. Stopping Distance the distance you need to stop your vehicle can determine a safe following distance, but your actual stopping distance will depend on many factors, including the time it takes a driver to see and recognize that there is a danger ahead. The length of time from perception of danger to using the brakes happens in three-quarter seconds. Weather conditions. Condition of your tire treads. Type and condition of your brakes. Night driving. Although there is usually less traffic at night, nearly half of all fatal traffic crashes in Minnesota occur after dark. To help ensure that you reach your destination safely, study road maps and directions before starting out. Make sure that your vehicle lights are working and your windshield is clean and free of defects. Headlights When you are within 1,000 feet of an oncoming vehicle or following another vehicle at a distance of 200 feet or less, your headlights must remain on low beam. Your headlights must be turned on at sunset and used until sunrise. They must also be used during weather conditions that include rain, snow, hail, sleet, or fog and any time you cannot clearly see the road ahead for a distance of at least 500 feet. Don't overdrive your headlights. You should be able to stop within the distance that your headlights illuminate the road. For most vehicles, this distance is no more than 350 feet on high beam. When driving in the dark, you may encounter glare from oncoming headlights or from the reflection of headlights in your rearview mirror. If you are blinded by the glare, use the white line along the edge of the road as a reference. For glare caused by headlights from behind you, use a day-night mirror or readjust your regular mirror. Freeway driving Freeways are multi-lane, divided highways, with limited access, from other roads. Because there are no stops or cross-traffic, they permit you to travel long distances without stopping. Entering the freeway Entry ramps are short, one-way roads that provide access to freeways. At the end of most entry ramps, you will find an acceleration lane that allows you to increase your speed in order to safely merge with traffic that is already on the freeway. To avoid disrupting traffic flow or cutting off other drivers when you merge, try to adjust your speed to accommodate vehicles already on the freeway. You must yield to other vehicles when you are merging. Use your turn signal to let other drivers know your intention. Watch for an opening in the nearest traffic lane and merge into the flow of traffic when you are able to do so. Do not stop on the ramp or in the acceleration lane unless it is absolutely necessary. When an acceleration lane is not available and a yield sign is posted on the entry ramp, obey the sign. Stop if it is necessary. Do not force your way into the lane of traffic. Freeway Ramp Meters Ramp meters are used on many freeway entry ramps in the metropolitan area to reduce traffic jams, crashes, and to make merging onto the freeway easier. The meters are traffic signals, placed about halfway down the entry ramp, that are usually activated during peak travel hours. 
red, yellow, and green lights indicate when drivers can proceed. It is illegal to go through the red light. Only one car may proceed each time the light is green. Freeway speed and lane use. Maintain the same approximate speed as surrounding vehicles, when possible, but never exceed the posted speed limits. If you are driving at a slower speed than other traffic, stay in the lane nearest to the right side of the road. If you must change lanes to pass other vehicles or to leave the freeway, signal your intent and make sure your path is clear before moving over. Use of freeway or expressway shoulders by buses. Transit buses and metro mobility buses are permitted to use the shoulder of a freeway or expressway. Buses authorized to use the shoulder may be operated only when mainline traffic speeds are less than 35 miles per hour. Drivers of buses being operated on the shoulder may not exceed the speed of mainline traffic by more than 15 miles per hour and may never exceed 35 miles per hour. Drivers of buses being operated on the shoulder must yield to merging, entering, and exiting traffic and must yield to other vehicles on the shoulder. Message Signs Message and lane use signs on some freeways warn drivers of traffic crashes, stalled vehicles, or other traffic conditions ahead. Message signs may be activated when the state issues an amber, America's missing, broadcast emergency response, alert in response to a child abduction. The signs will provide information, such as a vehicle description. Drivers who see a vehicle fitting the description, or who have other information about the missing child, will be asked to notify law enforcement. High Occupancy Vehicle Lanes These lanes are for use only by motorcycles, buses, and vehicles carrying two or more people. Freeway Interchange An interchange is the connection of a freeway to a road or another freeway by a series of ramps. The connecting roadways allow you to leave one road and enter another safely, without disrupting the flow of traffic. 89. Diverging Diamond Interchange A diverging diamond interchange is when traffic lanes cross over at each end of the bridge to eliminate left-hand turns across opposing traffic. Instead of making a sharp left turn, drivers veer to the left for access. These interchanges improve traffic safety and mobility and cut overall traffic delays up to 60%. Safety benefits of diverging diamond interchanges include Fewer conflict points Conflict points are spread out throughout the interchange. Better sight distance at turns. Wrong way entry to ramps is extremely difficult. Pedestrian crossings are shorter. Navigating a diverging diamond interchange. Traffic crisscrosses at either end of the bridge, so instead of making hard left turns, drivers veer to the left for access. Pedestrians cross to the middle of the bridge and walk in the middle between traffic lanes with protective barriers on either side. Stopping, Parking, and Backing Up It is illegal to stop or park a motor vehicle on an interstate freeway, except in the event of an emergency. Running out of fuel is not considered an emergency. If this occurs, you could receive a citation. If you must stop on the freeway because of an emergency, take the following actions. Park your vehicle on the shoulder, as far from the main roadway as possible. Open the trunk and raise the hood or tie a white cloth to the radio antenna or a door handle. Use hazard warning lights, if you have them. If you have flares or reflectors, place them from 100 to 500 feet behind your vehicle on the right edge of the main road. Stay with your vehicle, if possible. If you must leave your vehicle, do not walk on the area of the highway reserved for vehicle traffic. This is illegal and extremely dangerous. It is illegal to back up or turn around on a freeway. An exception to this law applies to drivers of emergency and road repair vehicles. Drivers of these vehicles may back up or turn around, as necessary, to perform their duties. Emergency Vehicles on the Freeway when you see the flashing lights of an ambulance, fire truck, or police car on the shoulder of the road, you must move a lane away from the emergency vehicle, if it is possible to do so safely. If you are not able to safely move a lane away, slow down. When you see an emergency vehicle with its lights and siren activated behind you, move to the nearest side of the road and stop.
Do not slam on the brakes or swerve into other lanes. Remember to use your turn signal. Remain stopped until the emergency vehicle has completely passed. Look for other emergency vehicles that may be following it before pulling out. Stay at least 500 feet back from any firefighting vehicle. Getting off the freeway. It is helpful to know, before you begin driving, where you need to exit the freeway. Watch for signs that provide information about upcoming exits. As you near the desired exit signal your intent to change lanes and move into the deceleration lane when you can do so safely. This should provide time to slow down before you reach the exit ramp. It should also help you to avoid obstructing faster-moving traffic. If you miss your exit, proceed to the next one. Do not back up or make a U-turn to return to the desired exit. Crashes If you are involved in a crash that results in injury, stay where you are. If you are able to do so, call 911 or the nearest law enforcement agency for help. If the crash results only in property damage, move to a safe location. Do Not step out of your vehicle until you have moved to a safe location, away from traffic. Exchange driver's license and insurance information with the other driver or drivers. Write down the license plate numbers of other vehicles involved. You may also wish to exchange vehicle identification numbers. Call for law enforcement assistance, if necessary. Distracted driving Driver distraction or inattention is a leading factor in crashes in Minnesota, accounting for at least 25% of all crashes annually. Drivers who are distracted fail to recognize potential hazards on the road and react more slowly to traffic conditions, decreasing their margin of safety. There are three main types of driver distraction. Visual, looking away from the road. Mechanical, slash physical, taking hands off the wheel. Cognitive, being lost in thought. Distractions inside the vehicle can include activities such as cell phone use, using a GPS, reaching for items, eating and drinking, adjusting the radio, talking to other passengers, and reading maps and other materials. Even when you are watching the road, behaviors such as looking at a crash scene, or even daydreaming, can divert attention from your driving responsibilities. For safety, make sure you give the task of driving your full attention at all times. There are certain driver behaviors that are illegal on Minnesota roads, specifically using a cell phone or wireless computer device for text messaging, emailing, or accessing the internet while driving, including while stopped in traffic. Drivers under age 18 with an instruction permit or provisional license using a cell phone, whether handheld or hands-free, except to call 911 in an emergency. Wearing headphones or earphones that are used in both ears simultaneously to listen to a radio or other sound-producing device. Aggressive driving People who drive aggressively tend to have a low level of concern for other motorists. They exhibit anger and frustration while driving, not necessarily as a result of other drivers' actions, but because of their personal mindset. Aggressive driving usually involves driving faster than surrounding. Vehicles, which leads to behaviors such as following too closely, changing lanes frequently and abruptly, often without signaling, passing other vehicles on the shoulder, and glaring at or threatening motorists around them. If you recognize your own behavior in this description, you should make a greater effort to stay calm when driving. It is important to share the road. Safe driving requires courtesy and cooperation from all drivers. If you are confronted by an aggressive driver, do not challenge him or her. Stay out of the person's way, avoid eye contact, and do not allow the situation to escalate. Obstructed view. It is illegal to drive a vehicle packed with a load or occupied by more than three people in the front seat if the items or people obstruct your view to the front or sides of the vehicle or interfere with your ability to control the vehicle. Carrying a projecting load. A load must not stick out more than three feet in front of the front wheels or bumper of any motor vehicle. If a load extends four feet or more from the rear of any vehicle, a red, yellow, or orange flag at least 16 inches square must be attached to the end of the load. At night, a red lantern or lamp, visible from a distance of at least 500 feet, 
must be attached to the end of the load. Passenger vehicles may not carry loads that extend beyond the line of the fenders on the left side and more than 6 inches beyond the fender line on the right side. Campers and Trailers If you pull a camper or trailer with your vehicle, you must maintain at least 500 feet following distance from other vehicles. When loaded, 10 to 15 percent of the trailer's weight should be balanced on the hitch between trailer and vehicle. When correctly loaded, the trailer's floor should be level. After the first few miles, stop and check the hitch, tires, lights, and load. Repeat this process at all rest stops. Travel at a slower speed. Many trailers have smaller wheels that turn at a faster rate than your car wheels, resulting in heat buildup that can cause trailer wheel bearings to fail. Remember that the brakes on your vehicle probably were not designed to handle heavy trailer loads. A sudden stop at high speed could flip both the trailer and the car. Speed up carefully, using a lower gear if necessary. Maintain enough following distance to prevent the need for sudden stops. When passing other vehicles, remember the additional length of your trailer and be aware that your ability to accelerate is reduced. Wind and rain will affect your ability to handle and control a vehicle pulling extra weight. When towing a trailer or camper in wet or windy conditions, reduce your speed more than you would normally do in such weather. Allow plenty of room for turns. Long trailers will swing closer to the edge of the road than your vehicle. Pay extra attention to your vehicle's cooling system when towing extra weight. Your engine will overheat more easily in warm weather, at high speeds, and in hilly areas. Trailer Requirements Measurements Maximum length, 45 feet, maximum width, 8 feet 6 inches, maximum height, 13 feet 6 inches, lights. Tail lamps, 2, red. Reflectors, 2, red. Rear license plate, 1, white. Trailer stop and turn signals must be used for night driving and whenever stop and turn signals on the towing vehicle are not visible to other drivers. The 102-inch width limit, 8 feet, 6 inches, for recreational vehicles does not include attachments that do not extend beyond the vehicle's exterior rearview mirrors if the recreational vehicle is self-propelled. The width of a trailer may not extend beyond the exterior rearview mirrors of the towing vehicle. Type A, B, or C motor homes may not be longer than 45 feet. The general length limit for single-unit vehicles is 40 feet. All trailers with a gross vehicle weight of 3,000 pounds or more must be equipped with brakes. All recreational trailers must have a clearly visible plate with current registration. A safety chain must be permanently attached to the trailer and fastened to the vehicle used for towing. Recreational Vehicle Combinations Recreational vehicle combination means a combination of not more than three vehicles consisting of a pickup truck or recreational truck tractor attached to a camper trailer that is hitched to it a trailer. The trailer may carry watercraft, motorcycles, motorized bicycles, off-highway motorcycles, snowmobiles, all-terrain vehicles, motorized golf carts, or equestrian equipment or supplies. You must be at least 18 years of age to drive a recreational vehicle combination. The towing rating of the pickup or recreational truck tractor must be equal to, or greater than, the total weight of all vehicles being towed. A recreational vehicle combination may not be more than 70 feet in length. A recreational vehicle combination may not be driven in the 7 county metropolitan area Monday through Friday during the hours of 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Winter Driving Vehicle Safety Remove snow and ice from your vehicle's hood, windows, and lights before driving. Make sure that your windshield wiper fluid contains antifreeze. Get the feel of the road, try your brakes, while driving slowly to test the road surface. Adjust your speed to road condition. Avoid using cruise control on slippery roads. If your vehicle becomes stuck on ice or snow, try to free your vehicle by rocking it back and forth. Keep the front wheels straight and slowly. Drive forward, then backward, as far as possible, without spinning the tires. Accelerate gently when the tires grip. 
If your vehicle starts to slide or your tires start to spin, apply the brake and repeat this operation in the opposite direction. Snow Emergencies and Parking Rules When a significant amount of snow accumulates, city officials may declare a snow emergency. Certain parking rules may go into effect while snow is removed from streets. Obey snow emergency parking rules to avoid towing and fines. Sharing the road with snowplows when roads are covered with snow or ice, watch for the flashing white, yellow, and blue lights of snowplows. Never crowd a snowplow. Pass snowplows only when you can see the entire vehicle. Stay well behind plows to avoid any flying sanding materials, snow, and ice that could strike your vehicle. Be alert for dangerous snow clouds or whiteout conditions. Snow plows can create clouds of blowing snow that may conceal the road and hide driving hazards. Snow plows and other removal equipment often move at slow speeds. In residential areas, they may back up in order to turn around. Give equipment operators room to do their job safely. Winter Survival Keep a survival kit in your vehicle. For safety, it is important to assemble a winter survival kit to keep in any vehicle you drive. Some recommended items include Shovel Container of sand or salt Warm clothing and footwear Red flag for your vehicle's antenna Blanket or sleeping bag Quick energy foods, drinking water, and an empty waste container Tow chain and tire chains Road flares or reflectors Jumper cables candles and matches or a lighter. First Aid Kit What to do if you become stranded? If you become stranded while traveling in cold weather, stay with your vehicle. Most deaths under these circumstances occur when people get out of their vehicles, become lost, and suffer prolonged exposure to the cold. Stay calm, wait for help to arrive, and take as many of the following steps as possible. Turn on your hazard warning lights. Attach a red flag to your radio antenna. Set out flags and flares, if possible. If clothing, blankets, and other survival supplies are stored in trunk, bring them inside the vehicle. Keep the exhaust pipe clear of snow and debris. Run the engine and heater until the vehicle is reasonably warm, and then turn it off. Repeat this process as long as fuel is available, or until you are rescued. Running the engine for approximately 10 minutes each hour, in order to charge the battery and warm the interior, is recommended. Even in extremely cold, leave at least one window partially open to let in fresh air. Occupants of an idling vehicle can suffer carbon monoxide poisoning if ventilation is not adequate. At least one person in the vehicle should remain awake at all times. Maintaining alertness and concentration Becoming tired or sleepy while behind the wheel is a common, yet very dangerous occurrence. To prevent this, be sure to get plenty of rest before starting out on a long drive. The following suggestions may help, but will have no lasting effect. Stop as often as you need to, at least once every 100 miles or every two hours. Get out of the car and walk, stretch, loosen up, and relax. Have something to eat or drink. If you have passengers, talk in order to stay alert. Ask someone else to drive when you begin to feel tired. If you are alone, listen to the radio or sing aloud. When the weather permits, open a window slightly to increase fresh airflow. Do not rely on stay-awake drugs. If none of this works, stop for the day or park far from the road and rest. If you stay in the car, lock all doors and open windows slightly to let in fresh air. Skidding When you are driving on a slippery road, slow down and maintain a safe distance from the vehicle in front of you. Do not use cruise control when the road surface is slippery. A vehicle skid occurs when tires lose their grip on the road surface. If this occurs, stay calm, do not overreact or slam on the brakes. Instead, take your foot off the accelerator and brakes until you can turn in the desired direction. Anti-lock braking Some vehicles have an electronic anti-lock braking system that helps keep the vehicle under control while braking. 
If you have anti-lock brakes, do not pump them as you would regular brakes. Instead, press down on the brake pedal and continue to steer the vehicle until you regain control. If you are not sure if your vehicle has anti-lock brakes, read your vehicle's owner's manual for specific instructions. Driving in heavy rain or fog. If you encounter thunderstorms or fog, reduce speed, use extra caution, and be prepared to stop. Increase your following distance. Your headlights, by law, must be used at times when you cannot see more than 500 feet ahead and when it is raining, snowing, sleeting, or hailing. Keep them on low beam to reduce glare. If you cannot see a safe distance ahead, pull off the road and stop until visibility improves. Hydroplaning At speeds of 35 miles per hour or less, most tires will wipe water off the road surface to keep tires in contact with the road. At higher speeds, water can collect under tires and lift them off the surface of the road, this is called hydroplaning. When your tires hydroplane, they lose all contact with the road. If this occurs, you will be unable to brake, accelerate, or change direction. If your tires begin to hydroplane, take your foot off the gas pedal. Hydroplaning is less likely to occur at normal highway speeds if your vehicle is equipped with good tires that have deep treads, which will allow water to escape. But hydroplaning can occur at any speed if the depth of the water on the road is greater than the depth of the tire treads. In heavy rain, standard cars may begin to hydroplane at 35 miles per hour. To prevent hydroplaning, keep your tires in good condition and reduce speed when driving on wet roads. Driving on narrow roads and hills. When you approach curves on narrow roads, or in areas where brush and trees block your view of the road ahead, you can use your horn to warn other drivers or pedestrians that you are on the road. It is not advised to coast down steep hills with your transmission in neutral. On steep hills, check your speedometer frequently. Vehicle speed will increase even when your foot is not on the accelerator. Blowouts A blowout is a burst tire that can throw your vehicle out of control. Before a blowout occurs, you may hear a thumping sound or notice the steering wheel pulling to the right or left. If you experience a blowout, hold the steering wheel tightly, steer straight ahead, and slowly ease your foot off the accelerator. Do not brake until the vehicle is back under your control. Pull the vehicle completely off the road at the nearest safe location. Steering Failure If the front wheels of your vehicle do not respond when you turn the steering wheel, ease up on the accelerator. Do not brake unless it is necessary to avoid a crash. Your vehicle may balance on its own and travel in a straight path as you reduce speed. If you must apply the brake, do so gently. If you brake suddenly, or try to shift gears, the change in speed may throw the vehicle off balance and out of control. Brake Failure A brake pedal that sinks slowly when pressure is applied is one sign that your vehicle's brakes may be failing. A warning light should come on if there is a serious problem. If your brake pedal suddenly sinks all the way to the floor, try pumping the pedal to build pressure. If this does not work, slowly apply your emergency slash parking brake. Applying the brake too abruptly could throw the vehicle into a skid. Remember, the emergency slash parking brake engages only the rear brakes. If road conditions allow you to coast to a stop, shift your car into a lower gear. Continue to downshift as you decelerate until you can safely pull over and stop. Running off the pavement If your wheels drift onto the shoulder of the road, do not try to swerve back onto the pavement. Stay on the shoulder and slowly release the gas pedal. After you have reduced your speed, turn back onto the pavement. Then speed up again. Watch out for deer. There are some things you can do to reduce your risk of hitting a deer. Deer are most active in the dusk to dawn hours, so you should be especially alert while driving during those times. Scan the sides of the road at night to watch for the reflection of your vehicle headlights in the eyes of deer. If you see such a reflection on the side of the road, slow down. Blow the horn and be ready to stop. Always watch for more than one deer. While deer crossings typically occur in rural settings, deer sometimes wander into towns or even cities. Deer may cross anywhere, anytime. Vehicle approaching in your lane. 
If a vehicle is traveling toward you in your lane, move to the right. Do not use the left lane to avoid the vehicle. The driver may return to the correct lane and will then be in your path. If the vehicle continues toward you, steer off the road to the right, if it is necessary to avoid a crash. Sounding your horn and flashing your headlights may help a sleepy or distracted driver to become alert. Vehicle trying to pass you. Another driver may wish to pass you on a two-lane road, with traffic moving in both directions. If the driver misjudges the speed of oncoming traffic or is unable, for another reason, to complete the pass, you and the other drivers are all in danger. You must act to prevent a crash. If the passing vehicle is nearly in position to move back into the right lane, slow down and allow the driver to complete the pass as quickly as possible. If the passing vehicle must drop back, speed up to make sure there is adequate room for the vehicle to move into the lane behind you. If a crash seems probable and the right shoulder is wide enough for your vehicle, quickly move to the right and allow the passing vehicle to move into your lane. Stalling on railroad tracks If your vehicle becomes stalled on railroad tracks and a train is approaching, leave the vehicle. To avoid being struck by debris from the collision, keep a safe distance from the tracks. Walk quickly in a 45-degree angle away from the tracks in the direction from which the train is approaching. Flooded roadways Flooding can occur when streams and rivers flow over their banks, when dams or levees break, when there is runoff from deep snow, or any time there is heavy rainfall. Floodwaters can be found on roads, bridges, and low areas. Flash floods can come rapidly and unexpectedly. They can occur within a few minutes or hours of excessive rainfall. Do not drive through flooded areas. If you see a flooded roadway ahead, turn around and find another route to get to your destination. Be cautious, especially at night, when the visibility is limited. Remember, six inches of water will reach the bottom of most passenger cars, causing loss of control or possible stalling. Two feet of moving water can carry away most vehicles including sport utility vehicles and pickup trucks. Even if the water appears shallow enough to cross, do not attempt to cross a flooded road. Water can hide dips, or worse, floodwaters can damage roadways by washing away the underlying road surface. If there is no other route, proceed to higher ground and wait for the waters to subside. Plunging underwater Most vehicles will float on the surface of water from 30 to 60 seconds. If your vehicle enters deep water, make every attempt to get out of the vehicle immediately. If possible, exit the vehicle through open windows before the water reaches the window level. If your vehicle becomes submerged, try not to panic. Vehicle doors cannot be opened until water pressure inside the car is equal to that outside. When the vehicle is completely filled, doors can be opened if there is no structural damage. The weight of the engine will cause the front end of the car to sink first. The rear passenger compartment may provide an air pocket while you plan your escape strategy. If there are other people in the vehicle, determine their condition and try to exit the vehicle together. Fire If you notice smoke rising from beneath the hood of your vehicle, pull off the road, turn off the ignition, and exit the vehicle immediately. Do not use water to put out the fire this will actually spread the blaze. Overheating Most vehicles have dashboard gauges or lights that indicate the engine temperature. Activities such as driving in stop-and-go traffic on a hot day, driving on steep inclines, and towing a trailer can cause your engine to run hotter than normal. When your engine becomes hot, turn off any unnecessary vehicle equipment, such as air conditioning. If the temperature is still too high, Turning on the heater will help draw hot air away from the engine. If these techniques do not work and engine temperature suddenly increases or steam rises from the engine, pull over to the side of the road, stop the vehicle, and turn off the ignition immediately. Headlight failure If your headlights suddenly go out, try your parking lights, hazard warning lights, or turn signals, one of them may work and give you enough light to guide you off the road. If your headlights fail on a busy or lighted road, you will probably have enough light to guide you. If all your lights fail on a dark, deserted road, slow down and keep your vehicle on the pavement until you can move safely onto the shoulder.
windshield wiper failure, or sudden opening of hood. If your windshield wipers suddenly fail in blinding rain or snow, slow down and activate your hazard warning lights. Do not reduce your speed drastically if other vehicles are behind you. Pull off the road and move to a safe location as soon as possible. If the hood of your vehicle suddenly opens, obstructing your view, you may be able to see through the space between the hood and dashboard. If this is not possible, roll down the window and lean over to look past the side of the hood. Activate your hazard warning lights, reduce speed, and choose a safe path to steer off the road. Stuck Gas Pedal If your gas pedal sticks, you may be able to free it by hooking your toe under the pedal and raising it. If this does not work, apply the brakes and shift into neutral, this will disengage the engine. Next, choose a safe path and steer to the shoulder of the road. If the shoulder is not paved, switch on your hazard lights and continue steering the vehicle in a straight path until you can safely pull over to the shoulder of the road. Vehicle Crash with a Utility Pole or Power Box If your car comes into contact with a utility pole, wire, or power box, you should. Stay in your vehicle and call 911. Only get out of the vehicle if it is on fire. If you must get out, jump from the vehicle with both feet together and shuffle your feet on the ground as you move away from the scene. Always assume all wires and equipment are electrified. Carbon Monoxide Poisoning and Safety Tips Carbon monoxide is a deadly, odorless, and colorless gas produced by engines. It can collect inside your vehicle when the windows are closed, or in your garage, if your engine is idling. The only cure for carbon monoxide. Poisoning is a good supply of fresh air. Early symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning include sudden fatigue, headache, dizziness, and nausea. If you experience any of these symptoms, open the windows, turn off the ignition, and get out of the vehicle or garage as soon as possible. Have the vehicle's exhaust system inspected if you suspect the exhaust system is leaking. Carbon monoxide poisoning occurs most frequently during winter months, when vehicle windows tend to be closed. When temperatures are cold, carbon monoxide can get trapped inside the garage even when the garage door is open completely. Carbon monoxide can seep into an attached house. Carbon monoxide can render a person unconscious within a few minutes. To reduce the risk of carbon monoxide poisoning and possibly death. Avoid idling a vehicle in a garage. A safer place to warm up a vehicle is in the driveway. Avoid sitting in a vehicle with the engine idling. Do not drive with all windows tightly closed. Avoid idling a vehicle when stuck in the snow or the mud. Make sure your vehicle's exhaust system does not leak and is not blocked. Periodically allow fresh air into the vehicle by lowering the windows. Chapter Driving in Minnesota is a privilege. You can lose. Your driving privileges if you break certain laws or fail to meet certain requirements. The Minnesota Department of Public Safety maintains your driving record, which contains information about driving and licensing violations in Minnesota and other states. Serious or recurring violations may result in loss of your driving privilege or restrictions on where, when, and what types of vehicle you may drive. License Withdrawal Your license may be withdrawn by suspension, revocation, or cancellation. If you commit an offense and your license is withdrawn, the Department of Public Safety will send you a notice of withdrawal and a list of requirements for reinstatement. Some of the conditions that could cause you to lose your driving privileges are listed below. Suspension Your driver's license may be suspended if you Repeatedly violate traffic laws Are convicted in court for a violation that contributed to a traffic crash resulting in death, personal injury, or serious property damage. Use, or allow someone else to use, your license for an illegal action. It is illegal to allow anyone to use your license or permit. Commit a traffic offense in another state that would be grounds for suspension in Minnesota. Are judged in court to be legally unfit to drive a motor vehicle. Fail to report a medical condition that would result in cancellation of driving privileges. Fail to stop for a school bus with its stop arm extended and its red lights flashing, 
within five years of a conviction for the same offense, are found to possess a fake or altered license. Make a fraudulent application for a license or identification card. Take any part of the driver's license examination for someone else, or allow someone else to take the examination for you. Falsely identify yourself to a police officer. Fail to appear in court or pay a fine on a motor vehicle-related violation when required to do so. Are convicted of a misdemeanor for a violation of Minnesota traffic law. Fail to pay court-ordered child support. Use, or allow someone else to use, a license, permit, or ID card to buy tobacco products for someone who is under 18 years of age, or alcohol for someone who is under 21 years of age. Are under 21 years of age, and the court determines that you drove a motor vehicle while consuming, or after consuming, alcohol. Pay a fee to the state or driver's license agent with a dishonored check. The suspension will be removed when the dishonored check and any related fees have been paid in full. Are convicted for theft of gasoline. After the period of suspension has ended, your driving privilege may be reinstated, if all requirements are met. One requirement is payment of the reinstatement fee. If your license expired during the suspension, period, or your name or address changed, you must apply for a new license and pay the appropriate fee. Revocation. Your driver's license may be revoked if you refuse to take a test to determine whether you are under the influence of alcohol or a controlled substance, or you fail such a test. Are convicted of manslaughter or any other criminal action while driving a motor vehicle. Are convicted of driving a motor vehicle while under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Are convicted of a felony in which you used a motor vehicle. Are convicted of driving in excess of 100 miles per hour. Are convicted of fleeing a police officer. Are convicted of failing to stop, identify yourself, and render aid when involved in a motor vehicle crash, especially one that involves death or personal injury to others. Are convicted of lying under oath, signing any legal document that contains false information about legal ownership or operation of a motor vehicle or making a false statement to the Department of Public Safety or its agents about such information. Plead guilty or forfeit bail for three violations in a single year of any Minnesota traffic law or ordinance that requires a jail sentence upon conviction. Are convicted of an offense in another state that would be grounds for revoking your license if you were convicted in Minnesota. Are convicted of a misdemeanor for driving a motor vehicle with prior knowledge that the owner of the vehicle did not have no-fault vehicle insurance. Own a vehicle without no-fault insurance and are found to have driven it, or allowed others to drive it, with full knowledge that the vehicle was not insured. Are convicted of a gross misdemeanor for failing to stop for a school bus with its stop arm extended and its red lights flashing. Are convicted of selling or possessing a controlled substance while operating a motor vehicle. After the period of revocation has ended, your driving privileges may be reinstated if all the reinstatement requirements on your withdrawal notice are met. You must show proper identification when you take the written test or road test. You must apply for a new license after all your testing requirements are met. Limited License under some circumstances, a limited license may be issued to a person whose driving privileges are revoked or suspended. Before a limited license will be issued, certain requirements must be met, including completion of any mandatory waiting periods. If you are issued a limited license, you are restricted to travel to and from your place of employment, travel to and from chemical dependency treatment or counseling. Providing transportation for dependent children and other dependents living in your household for medical, educational, or nutritional needs. Travel to and from a post-secondary institution at which you are enrolled. Cancellation Your license may be cancelled if you do not have a legal right to a driver's license that was issued to you. Your license may be cancelled if you Acquire a mental or physical disability that makes you incapable of driving a motor vehicle safely. Do not pass a test that is legally requested by the Department of Public Safety to determine your ability to drive safely. Give false or misleading information on your license application. 
your license will be cancelled for 60 days, or until the correct information is provided, whichever is longer. Commit a crime for which cancellation of your license is a legal punishment. Do not qualify for a driver's license under Minnesota law. Commercial driver's license disqualification. You can lose commercial driver's license privileges for committing certain driving offenses. See the Minnesota Commercial Driver's License Manual for information about commercial driver's license requirements. Chapter. It is illegal to operate a vehicle on Minnesota roads when impaired by alcohol or other substances. Alcohol and driving. Drinking and driving is a serious problem in Minnesota and across the nation. There is a strong relationship between alcohol use and severity of traffic crashes. Alcohol use is involved in more than one-third of the deaths on Minnesota roads each year. Crashes involving impaired drivers kill an average of 240 people each year in Minnesota and injure thousands of others. The person most often killed in an alcohol-related crash is the impaired driver. Young males are more likely than others to engage in this deadly behavior. Drugs and driving Drug-impaired driving is as dangerous as alcohol-impaired driving. Minnesota law prohibits driving while impaired by controlled or intoxicating substances. These substances include illegal drugs, prescription drugs, and over-the-counter drugs, cold medicines, as well as household products. These substances can cause drowsiness and impair a driver's mental and physical ability to safely operate a vehicle and to respond to driving conditions. Legal drugs that may not cause impairment alone can produce powerful intoxicating effects when mixed with alcohol. The safest rule is do not mix drugs with driving at all. Use of drugs can lead to traffic crashes resulting in death, injury, and property damage. It can lead to arrest, fines, and jail sentences. Possession and use of a drug given to a driver by a doctor is permitted if the doctor informs the driver that it will not affect safe driving ability. Pay attention to warning labels for legitimate drugs and medicines and to doctor's orders regarding possible effects. Stay away from illegal drugs. Don't use any drug that hides fatigue, the only cure for fatigue is rest. Effect of alcohol on driving skills. Alcohol is a depressant that slows body functions and impairs motor skills. The amount of alcohol in the blood is called the alcohol concentration. Higher alcohol concentration means a greater degree of impairment. Driving ability becomes impaired after one drink. Types of effects Alcohol affects the central nervous system and impairs the ability to drive safely. The following section describes how specific functions are affected by alcohol consumption. Judgment Drivers who consume alcohol misjudge their degree of impairment. They may drive too fast, misjudge stopping distance, fail to wear a seat belt, and forget to drive defensively. Vision Range of eye movement decreases, reducing peripheral vision. Blurred vision may also occur at high alcohol concentration levels. Reaction time Reaction time is slower. Impaired drivers cannot respond quickly to traffic signals, actions of other drivers and pedestrians and events that take place on the road around them. Steering Impaired drivers tend to oversteer, which can result in weaving and running off the road. Perception Impaired drivers do not notice sounds and sights, or do not interpret them correctly. Coordination and balance Impaired drivers lose the ability to combine steadiness with speed and accuracy. Attention Drivers have difficulty giving their attention to focus on the many tasks required to operate a motor vehicle. Things to know about alcohol A 12-ounce beer, a 5-ounce glass of wine, a typical mixed drink, and a 9-ounce wine cooler usually contain about the same amount of alcohol. It is important to realize, however, that mixed drinks may contain more than the standard 1 and a half ounces of alcohol, and the amount of alcohol in beers may vary by as much as 40%. The term proof refers to the strength of a drink and is equal to twice the percent of alcohol the substance contains. A bottle of 80 proof whiskey, for example, contains 40% alcohol. The period of time over which you drink affects your alcohol. 
concentration. If you consume more than one standard drink per hour, your alcohol concentration will increase. The effects of alcohol vary greatly among individuals. Factors such as age, gender, body weight, mood, food intake, metabolism, and genetics have an impact on how alcohol affects an individual. You may be affected differently by alcohol on different occasions due to fluctuating factors such as mood, food intake, and even sleepiness. Males and females are affected differently by alcohol. Men generally have more muscle tissue, which does not allow alcohol absorption into the bloodstream as readily as fat. A person who has a higher percentage of fat than another person of the same weight will reach a higher alcohol concentration by consuming the same amount of alcohol. The only way to reduce your alcohol concentration is to wait. Alcohol is generally eliminated at the rate of about one drink per hour, but many factors influence the amount of alcohol that is retained. The body eliminates 95% of alcohol through oxidation by the liver. The remaining alcohol is eliminated through breathing, perspiration, and urination. Drinking coffee, exercising, and taking cold showers do not increase the rate of oxidation. Making lower risk choices. Social drinking frequently leads to impaired driving. The safest policy is this, if you are going to drink, don't drive, and if you are going to drive, don't drink. Some alternatives to driving impaired are Designate a driver Call a taxi Call a friend Stay overnight at a friend's house Take away the keys if a friend is impaired Because alcohol consumption impairs judgment, it is important to make a decision while you are sober about how you will avoid impaired driving later. Minnesota DWI Law a person with an alcohol concentration of 0.08 or higher, 0.04 if the person is driving a commercial vehicle, who is in control of a moving or parked vehicle, can be arrested for driving while impaired, DWI. If a law enforcement officer can prove that alcohol caused the driver to commit driving errors, he or she can be arrested for DWI at an alcohol concentration level as low as 0.04. This law also applies to operation of off-road recreational vehicles or motorboats. Implied consent slash search warrant law. If a law enforcement officer has probable cause to believe a driver is impaired and is operating or in physical control of a motor vehicle, the driver is required to submit to a test of his or her blood, breath, or urine. It is a crime to refuse to submit to this test. Refusal to take the test will result in a one- to six-year revocation of driving privileges, depending upon the number of offenses on record. This law also applies to operation of off-road recreational vehicles or motorboats. A law enforcement officer may ask you to blow into a roadside preliminary screening device. This pre-arrest breath test helps the officer determine how much alcohol you have in your system. This instrument is only used as an indicator of your alcohol concentration level and the results have limited use as evidence in court. If you are arrested, you will be required to submit to a blood, breath, or urine test that can be used as evidence. Any law enforcement officer may ask you to take a test when you are under arrest for DWI. Refuse to take a pre-arrest breath test. Take and fail a pre-arrest breath test are involved in an alcohol-related crash that caused personal injury, property damage, or death. The pre-arrest breath test can be beneficial to drivers who appear to be intoxicated, but are not. Some medical conditions have symptoms similar to those associated with intoxication. Law enforcement officers will obtain medical assistance for drivers who are ill. Penalties Penalties associated with an alcohol-related revocation of a driver's license include a $680 reinstatement fee, application for a driver's license, and may also require enrollment in the Ignition Interlock Device Program. Each offense has unique criminal penalties in addition to administrative sanctions, depending on the arrest situation, previous driving violations, and criminal record. Penalties will be more severe if the driver has prior DWI arrests. 
has an alcohol concentration of 0.16 or above, has a child younger than 16 years of age in the vehicle at the time of the stop, is under 21 years of age, refuses a pre-arrest breath test, a driver who is found to have an alcohol concentration of 0.08 or above, or who refuses to take a test to determine an alcohol concentration, may receive a seven-day temporary license. At the end of the seven-day period, the offender's driver's license will be revoked. First offense. Minimum of 90-day revocation, 30 days if individual pleads guilty to DWI. No work permit will be issued until a 15-day revocation period has passed and until reinstatement requirements have been met. A work permit is not an option for drivers with an alcohol concentration of 0.16 or greater. Enrollment in the Ignition Interlock Device Program is an option. 90 days in jail and or $1,000 fine. Second offense. Minimum one-year license revocation if second offense occurred within 10 years of the first offense. Enrollment in the Ignition Interlock Device Program may be required. One year in jail and or $3,000 fine. License plates are impounded. Third offense. Loss of license for a minimum of three years if the third offense occurred within 10 years of the first two offenses. License is canceled. Chemical use assessment is required. Enrollment in the Ignition Interlock Device Program is required. One year in jail and or $3,000 fine. Vehicle is forfeited and license plates are impounded. Jail or maximum bail and electronic monitoring. Ignition Interlock Device Program The Ignition Interlock Device Program enhances public safety by monitoring alcohol offenders. The ignition interlock device is installed and connected to the starter. To start the vehicle, the driver must blow into the device. The device prevents the vehicle from starting if it detects an alcohol concentration at or above 0.02. First-time alcohol offenders with an alcohol concentration of 0.16 or above have the option of regaining their driver privileges by participating in the ignition interlock device program. Drivers whose licenses are cancelled and whose privileges are denied as inimical to public safety are required to enroll in the Ignition Interlock Device Program for a period of three to six years in order to regain full driving privileges. Felony DWI You may be charged for a felony DWI if you are arrested for a fourth DWI in a 10-year period, have previously been convicted of a felony DWI have been convicted of criminal vehicular homicide while under the influence of alcohol or drugs. A fourth offense may result in a loss of license for four years and until rehabilitation and other reinstatement requirements are met. The criminal penalties for felony DWI can include a sentence of up to seven years in prison with a five-year conditional release and a $14,000 fine. Underage drinking, no tolerance rule. The legal age to buy and drink alcohol in Minnesota is 21. It is illegal for a person under age 21 to operate a motor vehicle with any detectable amount of alcohol in their system. If convicted of this offense, you will have your driving privileges suspended for 30 days. A second conviction will result in suspension of driving privileges for 180 days. Commercial Driver's License and Alcohol and Controlled Substances You will lose your commercial driver's license for at least one year on the first offense if you drive a commercial vehicle when your alcohol concentration is 0.04 or more. If your alcohol concentration is less than 0.04 but detectable, you will be put out of service for 24 hours. Drive any vehicle when your alcohol concentration is 0.08 or higher. Refuse a blood, breath, or urine test while driving any motor vehicle. Are under the influence of a controlled substance. Leave the scene of a crash involving a motor vehicle that you were driving. Use any motor vehicle to commit a felony. If the offense occurs while you are operating a commercial motor vehicle that is placarded for hazardous materials, you will lose your commercial driver's license for at least three years. 
A second offense will result in permanent loss of your commercial driver's license. Using a commercial motor vehicle to commit a felony involving controlled substances will result in permanent loss of your commercial driver's license. Drivers who have a commercial license and are arrested for impaired driving in a passenger vehicle will be unable to obtain a work permit for a commercial vehicle during the withdrawal period. Other laws related to alcohol and controlled substances Cannabis It is illegal to operate a vehicle while under the influence of a cannabis product, lower potency hemp edible, a hemp-derived consumer product, an artificially derived cannabinoid, or tetrahydrocannabinols. Use It is illegal for a person to use cannabis flour, a cannabis product, lower potency hemp edible, a hemp derived consumer product, an artificially derived cannabinoid, or any other product containing an artificially derived cannabinoid in a motor vehicle when the vehicle is on a street or highway. Possession and open package law it is illegal for a person while in a private motor vehicle on a street or highway to possess a cannabis flower or product, a lower potency hemp edible, a hemp derived consumer product, or any other product containing an artificially derived cannabinoid that has been removed from the packaging it was sold in, the packaging has been opened or the seal broken, or part of the contents have been removed from the packaging. It is permitted for a package to be in the trunk of a vehicle or in another area of the vehicle not normally occupied by the driver and passengers if the vehicle does not have a trunk. Keeping a package in the utility compartment or glove compartment of a vehicle is not permitted. It is also illegal for the owner of a private vehicle, if the owner is not present in the vehicle, to keep or allow to be kept in the vehicle when the vehicle is on a street or highway any cannabis flower or product, a lower potency hemp edible a hemp-derived consumer product, or any other product containing an artificially derived cannabinoid that has been removed from the packaging it was sold in, the packaging has been opened or the seal broken, or part of the contents have been removed. From the packaging Open container It is unlawful to drink or to have an open container of any alcoholic beverage inside a motor vehicle when it is on a public street or highway. It is also unlawful to allow a passenger to drink or to have an open container of any alcoholic beverage inside a motor vehicle. Controlled Substances in Motor Vehicles It is unlawful to use, possess, or sell controlled substances in a motor vehicle. Chapter This chapter will help you locate services and information related to driving in Minnesota. Web Services Online services and information are available at drive.mn.gov. Here's a sample of what you can do. Schedule or reschedule a road or class D written test. Check to see if your driving privileges are valid. Report the sale of a vehicle. Renew your vehicle registration. Find the location of the office nearest to you. Print a driver's license manual. Download forms and information related to driver's licenses and the operation and ownership of a motor vehicle. Find approved driver education schools and improvement clinics. Office locations. Driver's license and motor vehicle services are available at more than 200 locations throughout the state. Office location information is available 24-7. Visit drive.mn.gov or call 651-297-2005. Contacts. Email dvs.driverslicense at state.mn.us Road Test Scheduling, Metro Only 651-284-1234 Office Locations 651-297-2005 Driver's License Information 651-297-3298 CDL Information 651-297-5029 Driver Evaluation 651-296-2025 Ignition Interlock 651-296-2948 No Fault Insurance Compliance 651-296-2025 Impounded Plates 651-297-5034 Vehicle Registration and Title 651-297-2126 
Specialty Plates 651-297-3166 Customer Assistance for Hearing Impaired Callers, TTY slash TDD, 651-282-6555 Other State Services State Patrol Information Line, 651-201-7100 Minnesota.road conditions 511 or visit www.511mn.org. MNDOT Motor Carrier Services 651 215 6330. Consumer Information Attorney General's Office 651 296 3353, toll free 800 657 3787. Minnesota Relay, for hearing impaired, 800-627-3529 website. Voter Registration Rather than opting in to register to vote when applying for or renewing a driver's license or identification card, data on applicants who provide documentation of citizenship, U.S. passport, U.S. birth certificate, certificate of citizenship, etc., will be automatically transmitted to the Office of Secretary of State to register the individual to vote. If an individual has previously applied for a credential in Minnesota, DVS may no longer have a record of the documents they used to prove identity. The person may provide documentation demonstrating citizenship to begin the voter registration process under the new system. DVS will not send data to the Office of Secretary of State, if the applicant provided these documents prior to October 1, 2023. If an individual does not wish to be registered to vote after providing DVS with citizenship documents, they must opt out with the Office of Secretary of State. More information about voting can be found at Organ, Eye, and Tissue Donation Donation is a beautiful, selfless gift. One person can save and heal up to 75 lives through the decision. The need is significant. Thousands of people are waiting for a life-saving or life-enhancing transplant. Your application for a Minnesota license or identification card contains a section where you can indicate your wish to become a donor after death. This serves as your consent, but it's also important to share your decision with your family. Even drivers under the age of 18 can designate themselves as donors with their parents' consent. Organs that can be donated include heart, lungs, liver, kidney, pancreas, and intestines. Organs are allocated to recipients based upon medical urgency, length of time waiting, genetic matching, and geography. Whole eyes or the cornea can be donated to help restore sight. Tissue, bone, and heart valves are used for reconstructive surgeries to repair damaged skin, heart defects, and more. The donation process does not prevent an open casket funeral. There is no charge for donation to the donor or their family. Visit DonateLifeMN.org for the full curriculum of donation education materials. For additional information about donating organs or tissue, Contact LifeSource at 1 888 5 donate 1 888 536 6283 or visit life-source.org. For information about donating whole eyes or corneas, contact the Lion's Gift of Sight at 1 866 88 SIGHT 1 866 887 4448 or visit lionsgiftofsight.umn.edu. For more information about donating tissue, contact American Donor Services at 1-877-365-DON-81-877-365-3668 or visit AmericanDonorServices.org. Index Aggressive Driving 92 Airbags 30, 48 Alcohol and Driving 107 Animal Safety 48 Bicycles 59 Blind Spots 35 Campers and Trailers 93 Carbon Monoxide 102 Careless and Reckless Driving 55 Carrying a Projecting Load 93 Changing Lanes 35 Child Safety Seat 47 Commercial Vehicles 61 Crashes 91
Drinking and Driving 107. Driver's License. Active Military Service 25. Applying for 13. Bring Identification 13. Commercial Driver's License Disqualification 106. Commercial Driver's Licenses 24. Drugs and Driving 107. Emergency Vehicles 54. Endorsements 24. Fees 27. Getting Your License 11. Graduated Driver's Licensing, GDL, System 19. Instruction Permit 19. License Classifications 23. Name Change 14. Peace Corps and Federal Foreign Service Employees 26. Provisional License 20. Renewal and Replacement 25. Revocation 104. Road Test 16. Suspension 103. Vision Screening 15. Who Cannot Be Licensed 12. Who Does Not Need a Minnesota License 11. Written Test 15. Fleeing a Police Officer 57. Freeway Driving 87. Highway Work Zones 65. Identification Cards 27. Ignition Interlock 111. Impaired Driving 107. J Turns 40. Lanes. Changing Lanes 35. Lane Markings 81. Lane Use Control Signals 80. Traffic Lanes 35. Motorcycle 61. Motorized Bicycle 61. Parking 43. Passing 42. Pavement Markings 81. Pedestrians 58. Railroad Crossing 64. Registering Your Vehicle 50. Right of Way and Yielding 54. Roundabouts 38. Safety Seat 47. School Buses 51. School Safety Patrol 53. Seat Belt 46. Signaling 34. Sign 67. Speed Limits 33. Stopping 51. Traffic Crash 49. Traffic Laws 33. Traffic Signal 77. Turns 36. Vehicle Requirements 28. What to do and expect when stopped by law enforcement 55. Winter Driving 94. Zipper